Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the City of Delray Beach's regular commission meeting scheduled for Tuesday, April 19th, 2022 at 4.06 p.m. Please call the roll. Mr. Frankel. Present. Ms. Cassell. Here. Mr. Ballston. Present. Ms. Johnson. Present. Mayor Petrolia. Here. And let's all stand for the pledge, please. All right, we are at the agenda approval. Any changes? Best, uh, may I please pull please. 6E settlement in the case of George Gretzis, the city of Delray Beach? Thank you. All right, so we'll move that to 7AA. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, entertain a motion to approve as amended. Motion to approve as amended. Second. Call the roll, please. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Boston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. All right, we're moving on to the presentations. We have a very <coughs> special presentation tonight, and this is with uh, for the family of Mr. Zach Strong, Alfred Zach Strong. So I'm going to go ahead and read into the record um, our, uh, our proclamation for Mr. Strong. Whereas Alfred S Zach Strong, if the family would like to come in, you're more than welcome to. I don't know if the family is outside. Hi, how are you? And you can, if you want to, uh, anybody who's in the family wants to, to hang up at the front here, that'd be great. So, come on in. Hi there. You can stand or you can sit, where, whatever you feel comfortable doing. Very good, thank you. All right, so I'm going to read into the record. Uh, whereas Alfred Zach Strong was born and raised in Delray Beach, Florida, and spent his 92 years of life living and working in the city alongside of his wife of 70 years, Lois Strong. And whereas Mr. Strong served this community as co-owner of Strong and Son Funeral Home, a community activist, former Community Redevelopment Agency Commissioner, member of the Spady Cultural Heritage Museum, women's softball coach, Sunday school teacher, member of the Delray Beach Masonic Lodge, member of the City of Delray Beach's Voters League, and chairman of the City of Delray Beach's Human Re Relations Board. And whereas Mr. Strong led the charge and organized efforts that led to the integration of the city's public beach. And whereas Mr. Strong started and served as the first president of the South Palm Beach County branch of the National Association for the Achievement of Colored People, NAACP, in 1981 to 1991. And where, whereas Mr. Strong served faithfully and dutifully as a following founding member of the West Atlantic Redevelopment Coalition, Inc., established in March of 1996 until his transition, making it possible for his community to continue the plight towards racial equity for all historically black neighborhood, uh, and all historically black neighborhood that is the set through the implementation of the set transformation plan. Mr. Strong's sole purpose for doing this was to protect residents of the set from being displaced from their homes as a result of eminent domain and gentrification. And whereas Mr. Strong's youngest son, Keith, started the Keith Strong annual Thanksgiving Feed the Families event in 1981 and organized it until his death in 1995. Mr. Strong and his wife continued Keith's legacy by founding the Keith Strong Memorial Foundation and continuing the Thanksgiving Day event. And whereas Mr. Strong in his 90s led the annual Let's Move walk, which followed his trek from Strong and Son's funeral home to the beach and back as his homage for his work in, in I'm sorry, integrating the beach. And whereas Mr. Strong was a well-known, highly respected, beloved, and socially active member of the South Florida and Palm Beach County's communi communities, and the city of Delray Beach expresses deep sorrow over Mr. Strong's transition on December 3rd, 2020. Now, therefore, I, Shelley Petrolia, mayor of the city of Delray Beach, on behalf of the city commission, do hereby proclaim the second Sunday 
of March as the Alfred Zach Strong Day. In witness thereof, I have hereto set my hand and caused the official seal of the city of Delray Beach, Florida, to be affixed to this 19th day of April of 2022. So that is our, our um, we, are, we have a, a, a day for Mr. Zach Strong, which we actually did, a, a pro, we did this a couple of years ago, I guess it was, maybe it wasn't 2020, maybe it was 2021, I can't remember these days, these years kind of um, come together. But it's great to have the family here to be able to say that we really appreciate and we wanna make sure that Mr. Strong's uh, memory is, is very, present within the city because he was such a, an important part of our city for so many years as as has been indicated in this so we thank you all for coming out and uh, it is our sincerest apologies that we did not recognize that you were here last time that we had it so we're very very thankful that you came back and we have a proclamation um, for you and then we're going to have you come down and take pictures i absolutely will in fact i was wondering if the family would like to come up front and we take one of the commission behind as well, or we can do it over to the side, whichever way you prefer. Absolutely. And invite the, uh, the strong family to come say whatever they'd like to say at the microphone, and this is right where you would stand. I'd like to say this uh, about my dad. Uh, when that beach was integrated, uh, I was nine years old when all this just started, and um, my dad was the one with a lot of the other teenagers to the beach. I didn't know what was going on. And they had a line of whites. He said, uh, you don't belong here. You need to go on the north side of the beach, somewhere in Boynton, where at that time, uh, no lifeguards. So that's what started uh, my dad. And then come to think of it, and. His inspiration, his leadership, caused a whole lot of other things to happen. I was a firefighter, and uh, we went too many blights. But I was a firefighter, I got promoted, one of the first officers got promoted during that time. But my dad, he loved people. Yes. Don't care what color you are, he just loved people. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing about him, he no nonsense. Because I know for a fact, I can witness that when he went inside my head. <laughs> so take my word for it. He loved you, but he would discipline you. And he, he just that way, he loved Delray Beach. Many times we sit down on the bench, my dad say, oh, man, I'm happy. I'm happy. That's dad. Thank you. Just real quick, um, just like my father said, my grandfather was a people person, hands down. Uh, growing up around him in his shadow, in the city, this room right here was a constant meeting ground. He was always in here, come through that door, stand right here, do his hands like this, and he just give it to you. 
give it to you. And he always like those those uh, men on that on those pictures right there. Those uh, former mayors. mayors, and also the mayors and the uh, former uh, police chiefs in the police department sat down and told me most of them who they were and the type of relationship we had with each and every one of them. So that was like history in itself, just sitting down and sitting up under him and just hearing those things. And it was two things that he didn't play about. That was Greater Mount Olive Missionary Baptist Church and the city of Derry Beach. If you want to get on this bad side, do not talk about those two things. <laughs> Greater Mount Olive and the city of Derry Beach. That man loved this city. Growing up, on Southwest Fifth Avenue, right now on the corner of Forest Street and Southwest Fifth Avenue, there's not too many things that he did not know in this city. He was very passionate about this city. He didn't play about this city. And he stood up for this city. He was, he was, he was a very, they call him the Martin Luther King. And when you get on his bad side, you turn into Malcolm X. So, so he, 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 was, he, he was very balanced. He was very balanced. But you know, see, he, he's, he's, he's missed. His spirit is still here. And, like, you know, it's just, it's Derry Beach. He was Derry Beach. Not just him or others, but he was the one, like, he was one of the few guys and people that stood up for this city. He was not, he was a very, very brave man. And, like, we were always cherish him. I know my time. Mention though. your name. Mention your name and where you work here. My name is Randell Scrum. I'm a code officer with uh, City of Derry Beach. Um, I've been working four years now. Um, right, I, I stay in Derry, too. Uh, also, uh, 500 North Congress, uh, Derry Beach, Florida, 33445. <laughs> it won't take two minutes of my time, but my last name is not strong. My last name is Trice. And I am one of the oldest employees at Strong and Son since 1980. But Mr. Strong rescued me when we segregated down in Boca Middle. And he's the reason why we was able to stay on the right and narrow path. Because when anything happened down to Boca Middle and Boca High, we knew that we can call on Mr. Afro Zach Strong to come to our rescue and that's why we are who we are today because of him. Oh. Andrea Bruton, 703 Place Savant, Delray Beach, Florida. Um, I think I'm probably the only resident of Delray or child or product of Delray that can say that Mr. Strong um, was watching out for me nine months before I was born. Mm -hmm. And I say that because my mom was one of his softball players. If you all excuse me, I just ran in from work. But my mother was one of his softball players and she was playing with me at about seven months pregnant. He tells the story all the time. She was running to third base and the ball was coming and he was telling her not to slide. And she slid anyway. <laughs> So um, from nine months of being in my mother's womb to coming out at 55 when he passed away, he was always instrumental in my life. Um, at eight years old, I got to play in a state of adult state championship softball tournament in Sarasota, Florida because of Mr. Strong. Uh, there are so many stories that I could tell, um, but I'm out of breath. <laughs> uh, I think Randell and, and the rest of the Strong have, have summed it up, and his work here in the city really sums it up. So to say that he's a Martin Luther King or Megar Evers or John, John Lewis is an understatement. He was all of that and more. Thank you, great. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Anybody up here want to say anything? Yes, please. Um, Mr. Strong, first of all, was a businessman. And he was, our, for a while there, the only funeral director in the city. And as everyone knows, you always need a funeral home 
funeral director in your most um, crucial terms, times rather, of losing a loved one. And my family entrusted Mr. Strong with both of my parents, my mother and my father. So that says a lot because you got to know him. He took care of the families, and that's all I have to say. He will always be remembered in this city, not only as taking care of families in their most downtime, most um, sad time of, their, of our lives, but he was a, a pioneer, and as they've all said, he loved the city. Not only did he do things that would encourage others, but in that time, you cannot imagine what it was like to live in a city and not be able to go to the beach. And so once he led the city, those of us who were strong enough and brave enough to follow him down to the beach, it was a miraculous things, thing. Uh, there are people today who don't go to the beach because of that ingrain, the beach is not for you. But for those who followed his lead, know what going to the beach means. Uh, it's a refreshing thing to do. So we thank you, Mr. Strong, for your leadership. We all, those of us who've stepped forward and tried to do things to better the city, to bring all communities together, he led the way. Thank you. Thank you. Anything? Yeah, I would, uh, I would just like to say I think it's fitting tonight that we're going to be next accept accepting the um, grant award mm -hmm. for the Let's Move event, which uh, the, uh, Mr. Zach Strong uh, walk is, is a part of. Um, I'll just say that it, you know, being involved in Delray Beach, you hear uh, a lot about legends, you know, and, or former mayors, former chiefs, but to actually get to know one, um, like Mr. Strong or even like a, a Mr. Simon and, and be able to have lunch with them or interview them um, is, is really special. And uh, still to this day, one of the coolest, coolest moments in Delray is when he actually referenced me. Because you wonder if like these people really know or remember you. They've, they've met so many people and have so many stories. Um, and so to really be able to connect with local legend, I mean, that's what he is, a local legend. Um, I was honored to do so and uh, honored to be up here um, as you read that proclamation there. Yeah. Great, very good. Anyone else? Well, I have to say that um, you know one of the first persons that I met um, when I was running was uh, Zach Strong. And uh, talk about uh, bringing you into the fold and really helping you to understand um, what, uh, what he was trying to accomplish in um, the Northwest Southwest specifically neighborhood and uh, um, Pompeii Park and, 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 uh, and other areas. It, it, was, it was really amazing. And I just have to tell you, he was a uniter, not a divider, no matter what. And uh, that was really what just will always stick with me with Mr. Strong. He was somebody that would bring you in, and even if you were not um, a person that uh, maybe the entire community um, you know, uh, embraced, uh, he did. And I think that that goes very far to who the person was of Mr. Strong. You always knew that you could reach out to Mr. Strong no matter what, and uh, I, we're gonna miss him. He was a really great person for our, in our community, and um, he's a huge shoes to fill. I don't think that it's possible to fill them, so thank you very much to the family for coming and for allowing us to uh, proclaim this day, um, Zach Strong Day, so thank you again. All right. <laughs> And moving on just uh, to in the same vein, which is the acceptance of the grant award in the amount of $1,000 for Let's Move. And this will be um, Prentice, are you coming up? Mr. Mobley? I see a check back there, so I know there, there he is. <laughs> Make a grand entrance. A uh, grand entrance, no, that's right. No, just kidding. Uh, good evening, everybody. Good evening. Commission, Mayor, uh, City Manager. Uh, we are here today, and what a great presentation to Mr. Strong, was a very uh, integral person in my life as well. You have a Prentice Mobile because you have a Mr. Zach Strong, and uh, the most humblest respect to uh, everything he's done in this community and uh, everyone he's inspired along the way. Uh, with that being said, I want to get into um, what we have here, which is the Let's Move. We had a couple nice pictures up there, as you can see, yes. Um, Let's Move is basically a a, uh, a movement that was started by Michelle, Michelle Obama a couple years ago that was trying to fight obesity and try to get people out and about to exercise and to be healthy. Uh, so um, here in Palm Beach County, Palm Health Foundation and also Digital Vibes as is now, 
uh, they have a uh, month-long competition during that month, during Let's Move Month, that different cities compete in, doing different things, active, showing how you can be involved, and uh, encouraging people to exercise. So uh, we're in the competition, as you can see, we're being here. And uh, we've done pretty well over the years, winning first place a couple of times. Y'all can give that a round of applause because we didn't win this year. So I just want to give that for the past. But um, yeah, so uh, this year we received uh, second place overall. Uh, we lost to Wellington. Uh, boo, yeah. And then, um, and, uh, but we did get first place from one of our subgroups, which is the Derrick Track Club, one of our largest programs out of Pompey Park, Parks and Recreation. And we have a track coach, he's here as well. Yes, what did you say? No, it was the Parks and Recreation first place in the track club was fourth place. That's right. Parks and Recreation was first place in the subdivision. And then track was fourth up under Parks and Recreation. Thank you, Miss Andrea. Appreciate that. Will gave me the wrong information. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> yes, and uh, like I said, that week long event is basically a bunch of events. We have the Alpha Strong Walk, which is one of our events that we do. We have Zumba. We have a pet rally at Old School Square. And we try to... Uh, include the whole community. So mo hopefully moving forward, we can get a, a, even a bigger buy-in from the city and everyone coming out so we can continue to represent Derry well in this competition and also encourage everybody to get out and exercise, be healthy, and participate in a lot of the recreation programming. So without that being said, that was a nice little introduction to what we actually have going. I have Miss Andrea here. <coughs> and we have the check that we receive that's made out to the City of Derry Beach Parks and Recreation for a thousand dollars. But let's move. 2022 champs. I wish I could take this to the bank. <laughs> uh, you play Andrea. You want to okay. speak, Andrea? Quickly? Yeah. Um, Princeton give us all of the credit that we deserve. Um, there, there's probably like 300 teams in the county. It's a citywide. It's a citywide competition. I mean, a countywide competition between cities. Um, Delray is the team to beat. Everybody want to beat Delray. So ev even at the awards presentation, we have, and I have to say it, we have other leaders from Wellington, from Lake Worth, from everywhere else. And we want to encourage our commissioners to be a part of that um, as well. So with that being said, I do have the check for $1,000. And then we also have a first place plaque for the most log minutes for the um, sub team division. I think Parks and Rec is going to take that. All right. But I'll give you yeah, I'll take, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and we'll give you all this. We up. get the check. Yes. <laughs> Can I, am I allowed to come up there? Yeah, um, Mr. Mr. Healy. I guess so. I mean, you'll take the check. Yep. However, we it. we do have we do have three um three let's move shirts that we want our, our city commissioner to re represent us with. Ryan has one already. Adam, I owe you, but I'm a, I am going to take care of the three ladies. I the ladies that. are right. Yeah, well, Thank I you. <laughs> I've, and I think that we all need to show up next year for the uh, Zach Strong Strong uh, you know day for Let's Move. Absolutely, definitely. You'll Thank I'll you. be there. Thank you. I'd like Sorry. to I'd like to request that um, somehow or another we be made better aware of it. I'm I did it one year, but this year I don't know what was going on. I missed it. So maybe a presentation or something to remind us it's coming up so that. I will I definitely do, do Facebook, that. So, yeah. I'll definitely. Princess, I'm gonna put that on you. Okay. Yes, somebody I'll tell keep, me. I'll take keep responsibility for that. I'll make go. sure you guys know. So, if I'm a pest, it's because you asked for it at this meeting today. Okay. You're not gonna be a pest. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. I don't know. I don't, just, that's okay. You figure it out. I think so. All right, very good. Thanks so much. We're moving on to resolution number 57-22, recognizing Roxanne Tillman for 30 years of service. And I'm going to read the resolution into the record. This is resolution number 57-22, resolution of the City of Del City Commission of the City of Delray Beach, Florida, recognizing and commending Roxanne Tillman for 30 years of service to the City of Delray Beach. Whereas Roxanne Tillman 
actually began her career at the city of Delray Beach in 1979 in the finance department, but left in 1989 to manage the fam a family business. On April 13th, 1992, she returned to the city, and on April 13th, 2022, reached a milestone in her career, having achieved 30 years of continuous full-time service with the city of Delray Beach, and we thank you for that. Whereas Roxanne joined the fire department, or fire rescue department as a secretary, and secretary one, and was soon promoted to staff assistant one, then to staff assistant two, then to administrative assistant, where she currently serves with distinction and honor. And whereas Roxanne has provided administrative support for many different divisions, division chiefs and assistant chiefs during her career, and has been recognized for her pro professionalism, her dedication, her excellent customer service, and her willingness to take ownership of any project she touches. And whereas Roxanne was instrumental in managing the department's EMS billing process for many years, ensuring that the city received reimbursements. She is known for being an excellent steward of public dollar by carefully handling the department purchasing functions and processing travel and training arrangements and reimbursements. Whereas Roxanne is an outstanding team player, she works well under pressure even when a multitude of people need her assistance in the midst of a crisis. She is a problem solver who always gets her jobs completed and projects completed on time. Now, therefore, let it be resolved by the City Commission of the City of Delray Beach, Florida, as follows. Section 1, that, rock, that the City of Commission of the City of Delray Beach hereby recognizes and commends Roxanne Tillman for a total of 40 years of dedicated and faithful public service. And section two, that the city commission hereby congratulates and expresses sincere thanks and appreciation to Roxanne Tillman for her many years of service and wishes her the best of health and happiness in her continued employment. This will be passed and adopted and signed in a regular session of the 19th day of April of 2022. Thank you and Thank you. congratulations. So, the Shea King Human Resource Generalist, I get the honor of presenting Roxanne with a plaque, a beautiful plaque, Ooh. to show a, a token of our love for you. Thank you. Because we appreciate all you do. Thank you. Take this. We have that. And we also have the proclamation that Mayor just read for you. <coughs> Thank you. And we're all honoring you with these 30 year anniversary hats. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Good job. And if you'd like to say something, we'd really like you to be here 30 more years. Oh, no, no, no. no. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Would you like to say something? Well, I wish I could stay a few more, but um, I think about another year and a half will do it for me. Um, it's been a great run. I love coming to work. I'm going to cry, so I don't Aww. want to say too much more. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Chief, did you want to say something? Yes, ma'am, just real quick. Sure. Um, 1979, I didn't know we hired 10-year-olds. So, <laughs> Thank you, Chief Sean. <laughs> so uh, anyways, I think I was a sophomore in high school then. But anyway, um, Roxanne and I first met. <laughs> Roxanne and I first met when I got hired here. Um, I got hired in, in December 20, on December 26, 19, uh, or, I'm sorry, 19, uh, 2016, and it was between Christmas break and nobody was around, right? So I kind of, there was only a few people in the, in the department that was there and nobody really knew who I was and I kind of came in, you know, surprisingly. And uh, she came back and when everybody was there and they're all wondering who the guy is down in the corner office and nobody would come down and talk to me or say anything. So she walks in, which I don't know if she got voted in or if she just said, oh, I'm going to go down there and find out what's going on. But she, uh, she came down like there. It's a Seinfeld and, episode, but go ahead. Yeah, she came in and said, who are you? And I said, I'm the acting fire chief. Who are you? She goes, oh, I'm Roxanne Tillman. Glad to meet you. And uh, we just headed off ever since. And um, what you read, those words are, are nothing compared to what she actually does there. She does so much. She helps anybody and everybody that comes in the, in the door. 
she, any of the people here that work for us, everybody knows if they have a problem or an issue, they can come to Roxanne. And if she can't figure it out, she finds somebody who will figure it out. And she's a blessing for us. And um, I know she's going to leave in the next two years. Um, I really do wish we can keep her for a lot longer because she is that much of an asset to this organization. So thank you very much, Roxanne. Thank you. Thank you, Roxanne. <laughs> Well, congratulations and thank you so much. It's a it's a blessing to have you here, Roxanne. Thank you. And we'll take you for as long as you'll la keep stay. Thank you very much. You got it. All right. All right. So we're going to move on to the next um, presentation, which is Match Point. Very exciting, Mr. Mita. Please give everybody a minute. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor, Commissioners, City Manager. Um, Sam Mita, Parks and Recreation Director. Uh, excited for the opportunity tonight. Uh, we haven't been able to do this through the last couple of years with COVID, but I'd like to invite Mark Barron, um, founder and tournament director of Match Point Inc., and who runs our Delray Beach Open every year. As you know, we had another successful event this year. We're very excited, and I'd like to welcome him to the podium here. We have a nice presentation for you. Beautiful. Hi everyone, my name is Mark Barron. I'm the tournament director for the Delray Beach Open. My residency most of the time is at 30 Northwest First Avenue, right down the street. Uh, I've been in this city one third of my life, more than one third of my life, and I'd like to do a presentation today. And first, I think we have a little clip for you. Okay. It's always nice to be back in Delray. Just seeing the city grow like it has. It's such a good good atmosphere. It's a beautiful place. The crowd's awesome. Thank you guys for coming out. Broken ticket sales records for the event's 30-year history. It's become such an event that every year it keeps getting bigger and bigger, and it's a place to be. I mean, you're going to be talking close to 15, 17 million dollars of economic impact. I mean, it's nice to know that people are making trips. They make their plans to come to Delray Beach. Uh, when they come here, they're just, uh, they say, entertain me. So uh, that's what the town does. They do it better than anyone. That's, uh, that's a big benefit to the community. This is our, our home court here in Delray. I've had so many awesome memories. It's good to be back. It feels good. Past two years with COVID going on and a lot of people at home all over the world, uh, our viewing audience increased over 100% for our event worldwide. For us and for the city, that denotes marketing going and coming to Delray Beach. The city, city of Delray Beach hotel rooms during the month of February, due to the occupancy was the most expensive hotel room in the county of Palm Beach County. 
during this past year, due to everything that was social media, the marketing, the TV coverage, except et cetera, the city received over forty million dollars in discount marketing, which is what we do all year round in social media, et cetera, to tell people, come here, not just during the event, but when you see it in February and you're cold in whatever country you're at, come during the summer. So the off season, supposedly, they call it that, is a place to come as well. The economic impact this year for the event was a little over $15 million, which the hotels and the restaurants and the purveyors of the different stores have called us and thanked us. But really, it's not us. It's the city now that people are coming to. Our 38 junior events that we bring here during the off season has become such a staple to the city right now that we have booked thousands of rooms from April through October, where the hotels now look forward to having all the juniors come all year round. With that said, I'd like to do a presentation, if I may, to the city. Yeah. Love it. I don't know. As gratitude for being the sponsor and the title sponsor of the Delray Beach Open, the Delray Beach Open and Match Point would like to present to the city this trophy. And on a last note, uh, you all uh, held up the uh, 30 hat, and actually that's going to change this year, and our whole marketing for 2023 event is going to be the 25 year, which is going to confuse the heck out of a lot of people, but that's why we're doing it. Uh, to let you all know, this will be our 25th year in Delray Beach, and our 31st year of the event. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. And it was a very uh, wonderful event for those who were able to go. Um, it, it was really um, spectacular. We had great weather, and uh, it was uh, great tennis as well. Um, so we appreciate it. Thank you very much, Mark. All right, moving on to our um, comments and inquiries for agenda and non-agenda items, starting with the city manager. Not at this time, Mayor. However, I would like to ask the Director of Public Works, Missy Barletto, to join us for our standard presentation, construction projects and other related activities. Very good. Good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. Missy Barletto, Director of Public Works. So our presentation tonight is, is pretty short, but it's very important. Um, the private construction projects, we only have um, one request from Atlantic Crossing. I'll get to that in just a second. I wanted to put on your radar screen that Aura Del Rey, which is um, to the west of Congress, or right off of Congress and Atlantic, will be coming forward with a request for road closure along Congress Avenue at some point in the future, while they put a water main underneath Congress Avenue. That, um, that is a Palm Beach County um, approval for that. And once they get that approval, we will be bringing it back. But I just wanted to put it on your radar screen that that one's coming. It will be, be um, not without inconvenience. Mm -hmm. um, right now we have 104 open permits for commercial sites. That's up four from the last time we reported. 152 open permits for single family home construction. That's the same as the last time and 832 open permits for single-family home 
improvement projects such as renovations, driveways, fences, and pools, and that's up nine from the last time. So before you go on, um, the aura, are you talking about there's going to be a lane closure on Atlantic or will it be over on Congress? I believe it will be on Congress. I have not seen the application yet. I just know that it's coming. Got it. Thanks. So the last time that we were here and had this presentation, um, I brought forward some requests from Atlantic Crossing. I've presented it differently this time than the way it was presented last time because they've changed up their request based on some of your comments. So on Federal Highway, the East, ban the east Lane northbound, 6th Avenue, they're, um, at, they've shortened their hours of work to six hours in the day from 9 a.m. until 3.30 p.m., Monday through Friday. There will not be any weekend work in, uh, in response to comments about, about the issues that that causes. From April 25th until April 29th, that will be to install stairs into the west stairwell, improve um, some stormwater site drainage that's been approved by FDOT, and to, to continue installing the landscaping on the west side of Building 3. On May 9th through May 20th, which is, is 10 working days, um, they'll be pouring the ornamental concrete in the art walk between Buildings 1 and 3. Um, that's actually seven days worth of work, but they've included three potential days for rain delay. So if they get done bef without needing those 10, 10, complete 10 days, they'll reopen Good. before that time. So at the last time we had talked about Northeast First Street, and we had talked about trying to keep one lane of Northeast First Street open to give residents ingress and egress to their homes. In, in reviewing the kind of work that has to happen to re pull the sheet piles out of the edge of that, um, that there's just not enough right of way to allow any kind of traffic in there with the cranes, the, the front end loaders, the, all of the different heavy equipment that is, is required to move around in that space. Um, so the Atlantic Crossing folks are requesting a full road closure um, from April 25th through May 13th in order to remove the sheet piles on the north side of that property along Northeast First Street. How do the residents get to their property at the end of uh, first? So this won't be the first time that they've had to do this, but they will need to cut through the shopping plaza they're just to the east of 7th Avenue and go through where the um, Veterans Park um, parking area is by the Veterans Park Community Center. So they will have ingress and egress to their homes, it, just not through a standard route. Got it. So are there any questions about these, these potential road closures, the ones on Federal Highway, those permits are given by um, DOT. On Northeast First Street, that is a city, um, a city approval process. Would you please orient us a little bit better? I know I see North Federal. Where is their building? Because oh, this no, is that's the- that's an old picture. Oh, okay. Yeah, these pictures- You're just pictures, looking at the cleared land. Yeah, these pictures are pulled out of their permit applications. And it, it doesn't Building show the construction. No. May I just say thank you. Uh, the sidewalk opened. I know that you were very persistent on that, and I appreciate it. It was very exciting. Thank well, you thank for that. Thank you. I have to say that the, the developers for Atlantic Crossings worked very closely with us and, and tried their best to be sure that we got the sidewalk open in time for the Delray Affair. Thank you. And if I may ask one other question, I don't know where if you're continuing on or if you're done, but um, with respect to Aura on Congress, I'm noticing a really big increase in the traffic of late. And mm -hmm. what you see is people coming, going south on Congress, looking to take that left turn. There's the, the two lanes. Mm -hmm. It takes three lights. And what's happening is they're ending up um, creating a backup to the people who want to go straight because they're coming out into the lane. 
when this uh, lane is closed, is there a way to inquire about lengthening the amount of time on the lights just at that intersection so that we can move traffic more freely? We can work with Palm Beach County on that. Okay. Both of those items would be Palm Beach County's right. um, under their control. Got it. But I will have the city engineer reach out to them and ask them to take a look at that specifically. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. If it's already no choking up and we are now down a, a, a lane, it's going to end up just being an absolute uh, bottleneck. There's not going to be any movement because, again, when you do get backed up, you're backing up for that turn. Mm -hmm. Everybody wanting to make that turn onto eastbound Federal. I'm sorry, eastbound Atlantic. Yeah. You'd be trying to get to I-95. It's it's a mess. Okay. Very good. We'll take a look. Are at we going to um, also advertise that to any of the communities that are coming down? If it's going to be a, a, a fairly lengthy time frame, so I'm wondering if we shouldn't have one of those flashing signs that we're going to have construction because people can find their ways around whether it's going down to Barwick or um, heading over to um, what is it tent that goes across in front of Spady um, there's ways of being able to maneuver around if they are mm -hmm. aware of it rather than getting choked down in the traffic and joining that I'll also have them um, have them come um, coordinate with Palm Beach County on that and then we will have those conversations with the the developers as well perfect thanks so one last thing I wanted to give you an update on a city project from, from last week. We had talked about Island Drive Bridge um, off and on since the onset of construction there. Um, as we're doing the, the construction underneath the bridge and doing the bridge repairs that were required, we've discovered that some of the, once we remove the spalling um, con concrete off the edges of the the batter piles, we've discovered that the condition underneath is worse than what we had anticipated. And so we are going to be, for safety reasons, we're going to be limiting that, that bridge traffic to one single lane straight down the center of the bridge. And there will only be one car at a time allowed on the bridge. So I just wanted to bring that to your to your attention before we do that, which will be in the next day or so to protect the safety of the residents and the workers in that area. Very good, thank you. I, I'd like to say, but this, the, these pictures to me are astonishing. Um, just imagine that we have allowed our residents to come back and forth on this these bridges. And I dare say if we were to look at all of them, we might see something even worse so I, I just, I'm always a marvel, I always marvel at what we do and why we, how we've been so blessed not to have something really disastrous happen. Well, I, I would like to say that, that this is after we've removed concrete from around the outside of it. So we've been chipping away at it. It didn't look like that initially, but we, we get down to the center part of it to see where the damage is and how much of that needs to be repaired before we start. So we, we this particular bridge was definitely in need of repairs at this time. We did not want to delay those repairs any longer, but um, there was never a time when anyone was not in a safe condition. How old is the bridge, do you know? I do not know right off the top of my head, but just, I can look it up. Just wondering, because we have others that are probably older. Are you going to report on what's happening on Lake Ida? The um, the lake, the bridge on Lake Drive? No, no, no. The tr between SD Spady and, let's say, Swinton. I was driving there today, yesterday, and now there are cones up and down, and I didn't remember your reporting on it unless I missed it. There's something going on. I did not report on it. That is uh, Lake Ida Road, also is a county road, which which makes it um, more difficult for us to report on on a regular basis. I do know that they have some road improvement um, that they're doing in that area. I they have not reached out to us to coordinate with us on on what those repairs are but I can reach out to them and find out and get more information to you. It's a very busy, busy, because people stop using Atlantic Avenue, and it's the 
further is north mm -hmm. road, mm -hmm. uh, east-west. I'm just astonished at, as to how much traffic now flows on it and to just all of a sudden see these cones that go, I want to say all the way from Spady east to mm -hmm. um, Swinton. All of a sudden then I said, Missy didn't tell me about this, so. No, she didn't. Very good. Just to clarify, to, to agree with you, I was there this morning. It was backed up all the way to um, Congress because it was one lane, and people, uh, the parents, I think, were taking their, their children, children to, to school. Mm -hmm. It's a major operation. It looks like there's some infrastructure or some pipes or something. So it's not like uh, a block or so. Well, I do know that they are working operation. on their on their stormwater drainage system along two there, weeks. but two I weeks. two weeks. Two weeks. Oh. Yeah. Thank you. Chief. So apparently they coordinate with the police department. <laughs> I think he looked it up. <laughs> I think he just looked it up. I think he did a so, quick Google. I received a complaint on that the other day, so I had officers go out there to monitor the situation. Chief, do you want to go to the mic because it's not going to pick up? I will say, Chief, your police officers were giving out tickets this morning. <laughs> Chief Sims, Derry PD. Hello, everyone. I received a complaint uh, regarding Lake Ida and I sent some officers over there to monitor the situation. There is construction going on, and it's going to be for at least two weeks. We're working with the school board to work on some alternative uh, routes right now. Fantastic. Okay. Because they use Lake Ida to go into the school to uh, drop their children off in the morning, and well, they the go right lane that turns into up. the school is kind of the lane that's Being shut there. off. Mm -hmm. So they're going to open up the other side to uh, help with another entrance way coming in off of, uh, what's the name of the center over there? Uh, Achievement, Park? Achievement Center? Park? Yeah, Achievement Center. Achievement Center. Yes. So they're going to have the parents. There's another gate that, that opens on the, on the opposite side. They'll start they rerouting the traffic. They'll reroute the traffic. They can, they can so stack some of the traffic in that the direction. the neighborhood. And it's well, the, it comes up right along uh, the, the, uh, the east side of uh, Spady. The road they're comes around the east side of Spady. Okay, they're going to impact the neighborhood even more than they yeah. do already because they exit coming and going in the mornings into the community. So anyway, yeah. thanks for the heads it'll up. Be, it'll Chief. be temporary, hopefully, and it won't well, be. It's supposed to last, according to the report, about two weeks. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> and this is how the city communicates the inconveniences that we create out there in the community. Well, we thank you for that. So, if you have no more questions, that's the end of my report. We appreciate it. Thank you. Mr. Moore, anything more? No, ma'am. We yield at this time. Thank you. All right. Very good. So now it's time for public comment. Um, meeting is now open to public comment from anyone wishing to speak on any topic or agenda item other than a quasi-judicial item or a public hearing item. The public will have the opportunity to speak on a quasi-judicial and public hearing item later in the meeting as those items are called. For public comment, please sign in, state your name, address, and you will have three minutes. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi, Todd Herbst, um, List Road, West Palm Beach, Florida. I've been in front of you guys many times before. Hello. Um, I'm co-owner of City Oyster, Rocco's Tacos, and Elisa Betta's. And um, first, I want to thank you all for everything that you have done during the pandemic. Um, you've been extremely helpful, along with also Laura Simon. Uh, you've afforded us many conveniences that made it a little bit easier during a very difficult time. That being said, one of the things that not only we thoroughly enjoyed and benefited uh, by, but the public as well, is the added outdoor seating. And my understanding is that it was temporary, and we know that, and it's meant to expire, <clears throat> I believe, May 1st. And I'm here to ask if we could keep it going for a little bit longer. And uh, the reason being is it's exceptionally popular. Hey, the outdoor seating's always been popular. Um, now so more than ever, there are still uh, people out there who are afraid of getting COVID, um, and people just generally enjoy dining outside. So we benefit specifically at City Oyster by taking the space in the vacant building next to us, which I believe will be vacant for quite some time. And it's basically, it's not abandoned, but it certainly looks it. And from an appearance sake, again, we benefit from this. 
Uh, but from an appearance sake, it looks a little bit more active. enticing and active having tables and chairs out there with white tablecloths and people dining and enjoying themselves. The other place where we benefit from it is at Elisa Betta's in front of Honey. And I love Honey, and I love the owners of Honey, and they do a wonderful job, but it is a bar. So we have about three tables out in front of Honey, same thing, nice tables, tablecloths, and, and adults having, having dinner. Uh, so I don't necessarily see the harm in extending it. Um, I know some of the other restaurants, no, I'm, I'm sorry, any restaurant that has this would love to see it extended. And the city does get revenue because there is an increase in the permit fees because it's based on a square footage, including what you're using that's not directly in front of your storefront or your restaurant. So that's, um, that's my pitch. It's great. It's wonderful. We're doing much better. Thank you again. We're back. And um, thank you, and have a good night. Thank you, Tom. Anyone else? Hi. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. Mr. Moore, Lynn, Kateri, it's nice to see you. Uh, Carrie Glickstein, 1118 Waterway Lane. Um, I'm here tonight with two requests. One is, is very simple, the other a bit more challenging. Um, the first, I've been fortunate uh, to have lived by the beach area for the past 30 years and um, on most mornings have enjoyed walking the sidewalk, uh, particularly since we increased the width. And, and you know, the popularity of that has increased uh, tremendously over the years. And uh, on any given day between 6 a.m. and 8 a.m., you know, you'll see such a cross-section of the city, tourists, locals alike. But, but what is particularly remarkable is there is an employee of waste management, a garbage man by the name of Trevor Barretts, who for the past few years, at least in my view, has been a goodwill ambassador for this city, the likes of which in my entire time in this town, I have not seen a, a, a close second. Uh, he greets everyone every morning with this uh, ear to ear smile, happy Monday, happy Friday, are you enjoying your day? And this is a garbage man. And uh, I can't tell you how many people I walk away from who he is now on first name, last name basis with, and who remark about, you know, how can I have a bad day with this attitude from 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 this guy and um, again his name is Trevor Barretts um, I sent a letter to the CEO of waste management um, uh, haven't heard back mm -hmm. um, hope it didn't go in the trash no pun intended but but um, in any event I hope there's somebody here at the city who could acknowledge uh, what he does because it is truly remarkable um, the second request is a bit more challenging. Um, given where I live, um, I use Andrews Avenue several times a day for the past close to 30 years. And Andrews Avenue has become um, kind of a A1A bypass through the years. The traffic has increased, the speed has increased, commensurate with the impatience that's increased. Um, Andrews has no sidewalks. Mm -hmm. um, it's poorly lit. I have seen through the years countless close calls, uh, myself included, between automobiles, pedestrians, bikers. If you just bear with me just a minute, um, uh, please. Um, and this past weekend, Easter holiday, I actually saw a woman in a wheelchair trying to avoid who was being pushed as there were two cars coming passing each other the intersection of vista del mar mm -hmm. and andrews which is treacherous mm -hmm. um uh when the wheelchair hit the grass she literally fell out of the wheelchair mm -hmm. and it's just you know it, i understand residents have allowed their landscaping i don't know whose obligation it is where the right-of-way starts or mm -hmm. stops but if you were to drive down Andrews today, 
you cannot walk it without walking in a travel lane. And, and so I would ask the city manager or engineering somebody, I'm sure this isn't the first time somebody has mentioned it. Um, it there's a serious accident or worse um, that is bound to happen if it, perhaps it already has, but if you could just take a look at that, it's, it's, it's complicated, people aren't gonna like it, but it's, it's time is, is, is overdue. Thank Absolutely. you very much. Absolutely, thank you very much. Thanks for um, mentioning that. I would have to tell you, I mean, it's something that I know that the um, BPOA has uh, brought forward, especially the lighting and um, no, no ability to be able to walk from, let's just say, um, the more, well, it's a heavily tra traveled area. It used to be more heavily traveled up to Vista Del Mar to Atlantic, but it's now the whole um, continuum because of the uh, number of people that are there and also trying to get down to the avenue without taking a car. It just makes sense. It's a block away for many of these folks. So we need to probably look into that. So I, I challenge you to do whatever you can on that. Sure, I will work closely with public works engineering section to consider respective solutions and offer a report back. Very good, thank you so much. Thanks for coming in. Hi, there. Hi good evening, everyone. Uh, Laura Simon, the Downtown Development Authority Director, and um, I'm here to uh, echo Todd Herb's uh, comments as well as on behalf of the downtown restaurateurs that aren't here present um, in our community. And first, thank you for your support. May, March 20th, 2020, we started this reopen task force and came up with lots of, uh, I think Todd served on that committee, um, with lots of other business uh, owners in our community to create these opportunities for us to recover in our downtown to rebound uh, in our city, citywide. So I think um, as we you all discuss this tonight, just to keep that in mind that it is you know still there's still a lot of uh, recovering to happen. It is definitely an asset, the sidewalk cafe extension as well as the parking areas for other businesses that don't have outdoor seating to allow patrons to benefit from that. It's still um, hesitant. Um, people still feel hesitant about the indoor. It is the number one choice to be outside. Um, we would just in, uh, encourage you to just really think about that. I'm here all night if you have questions when you get to that item. Uh, on the agenda and then also uh, thank you all for the town hall on last week April 13th for conducting that town hall for our community uh, it was great to be invited to be part of that uh, we are going to also with the downtown development authority be doing as we move into our goal setting we're doing some uh, meetings workshops together to see how we can continue to grow and be a positive impact to our community so that look for that on our website downtowndarbeach.com Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. This is my first time being here, so I apologize if I'm not going to come across as um, one of the previous presenters. My name is Manana Arguliani. I'm a relatively new resident to Delray Beach. Um, we love living here. Uh, my child also goes to one of the elementary schools here, which is a part of the uh, Choice Program. It's a lottery program, as you know, of Palm Beach uh, County. I'm here on behalf of many residents in Delray. And what we are faced with is this not, nothing new to you, but I just want to know what is it done? It's about middle school. Currently, we have only one middle school, which is public middle school here, Carver which is absolutely underutilized, it's a failing school. I just feel that right across, basically, just Boca residents are paying the same amount of taxes as I pay, or many of our residents, and yet, all top A-rated schools, concentration even, choice programs, are in Boca. And I do have a problem with that, and many of our residents have a problem with that, because for those choice programs, those Boca residents, they do have great top A-rated schools. However, they also get priority to those choice programs, and I'm talking about middle schools specifically. When I raised this issue with Palm Beach ISD, I was simply actually you know, suggested to buy a house in Boca Raton. Well, I don't want to buy a house in Boca Raton. I bought in Del Rey. I love uh, my community. I love this city, and this is why I'm here, and this is where I'm going to continue to reside. I just think that, you know what, we need, I don't know, we're, we're not less educated, let's say, in Del Rey Beach. Um, our kids deserve better. 
We should have quality education for everybody. This should not be a privilege. This should be our children's right. And this is not right. What are we doing about it? This is why I'm exactly here. I would like to know what plans do you have. I also contacted here Ms. Janet Mix, and I am going to be involved. I just want to know what exactly, what steps, how are, we gonna, how are you going to vouch for us with Palm Beach ISD? Why we're not having those schools here? What can we do? Thank you. Thank you. Um, Palm Beach ISD, could you tell me what that is? I'm sorry, the, uh, the Palm Beach is just the school district. School district. You're referring to the school district of Palm Beach County. I think you used the term ISD, which okay, typically sorry, stands for Independent yeah. School District in other states. Texas, so Texas that's what it's called. Exactly. Yes. So this is why I just, you know, it's not high policy. Very good. Of course. Yeah. Um, it's and not. I am for all residents. It's not specifically <coughs> my child's case. I'm all for because this Thank is it, this is a huge issue. Thank you. I think I'd like to tell you. I believe that Village Academy has middle school also. No, it also doesn't. Building, <coughs> and it's also oh, I know that. Building. I do know that. I just okay, so, wanted to um, say you said Carver was the only middle school. And that one is a choice, too. Pardon me? Amplimosa, I was just going to yeah. correct and write That one is elementary. It's also middle. It expanded. Also, yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. Another man, former mayor. Yeah, this is, yeah. I know. It's a big night tonight here. Doing them in order. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, members of the commission, Madam Mayor, City Manager, City Attorney. Um, I'll make this brief for me. Um, I'm, I'm here on item 7D, which is talking about the outdoor dining, and others have articulated it uh, as well. You know, we live in Florida, which kind of, and in Delray, we kind of talk about outdoor living and everything. So I saw the three solutions, the three recommendations that you should follow. I would offer a fourth, which would be an expansion of your second, which is you'll allow it to stay, in, stay around for a while, but you need to develop some proper rules and regulations for how these uh, facilities should operate. I'm, I am, I, I'm very much in favor of outdoor dining, especially in these days. We don't know what the next pandemic is going to be. We don't know all that stuff. But I, generally, people love outdoor dining. Um, you, you, some are going to be in residential neighborhoods. Maybe they have stricter, stricter rules. Some are going to be next to railroad tracks. They may have different rules. But we need good rules and regulations, and we need enforcement. Part of the big problem we've had with a lot of the outdoor activities is enforcement. Um, and, you know, I know there are challenges in the budget, but we could use good code enforcement to be out at night with these places, because if we're allowing people to be outdoors at 10, 11 for outdoor dining or outdoor or liquor or any of those types of uh, services, which I support, um, I think we can develop good rules and regulations to, to monitor them. I do think we should keep them. I don't think we should shut, the, uh, shut them down. I don't like the idea of saying, you know, anybody that's applied now is fine, and then, but, you know, afterwards they can't. I've never liked creating two classes of citizens, generally speaking, because we don't know two months from now somebody comes in with a great idea, which would be perfect, but we have to say, geez, I'm sorry, we, you know, we, we shut you off. So all I'm doing is to encourage you to keep this open for a while. Let's really develop some nice ways to regulate them, to ensure that they are compatible with the neighborhoods. And with that, I think everyone is going to have uh, a good experience because we are in Florida. And as I say, you know, we, 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 we have outdoor living here, and I think we should continue to have outdoor living. Thank you all for can, thank you for all the work that you do. Thank you. Before you go, sir, can I get you to state your name for oh, the yes. record, please? <laughs> what was that? The Finding Forest. Remember the Finding Forest? Sir? I'm that one. Um, uh, Tom Carney, 135 Southeast Fifth Avenue, Delray Beach. Thank you. Good catch. Um, okay, so um, <laughs> I'm just picturing him riding on the back of Mayor Glickstein's motorcycle to get here. There you go. <laughs> together, like together again. Um, you know, I, I know that the lady just left, um, the um, woman that was talking about elementary schools, but hopefully, Janet, if you're here or you can hear this, um, that you'll follow up with her to explain how things work. Oh, there we go. Um, things work in, in Palm Beach County, which is basically that there is a, you know, the city commission is not in any way um, able to, other than just lobby, which we do. Um, we just went through a, a tough session talking about failing schools in our city and how disappointed we are. Um, but there is very there was very little movement with that um, and understanding. But that's the area that actually makes the difference. We can't tell them what to do in our town. They actually run the schools, decide what programming goes in the schools. It's beyond our control other than 
to push hard, and that's what we do. Um, the best person to speak with in our city would be our um, Janet Meeks, who is uh, the person that kind of um, is our liaison between the school. But we do our fair share all up here Thank of, that's exactly yes, that's what we're doing. We, yep. we, we do, we do promise you that. You can go back and look at some of the more recent meetings that we've had um, and understanding that we are taking uh, a stance on it, but it's been a hard, hard uh, nut to break and people like you can make a difference too because, we will. yeah, we will. very good, get your well, group up. They just feel like the other way can be overlooked. Because and it's not, not fair, not we understand. And, and the way that we work here is that it's typically not a back and forth. Um, at this point, I'm just kind of giving you that information and, and so that you can go ahead and follow through with Janet. But thank you so much for coming in. Um, thank Mayor, you for caring about our children. Could you just add that um, people interested should apply to the education board? Thank Very you. Good. Thank you, perfect. All right, <laughs> sounds great. Well, we're gonna move on now. You got it, to the, cons to the consent agenda. Um, uh, if there's no other changes or, you know, I did have one thing I did want to ask about, but I, I think I can ask in comments. So uh, I want, I'm not going to take anything off. So if there's no other changes, uh, I'll, I'll entertain a motion. Motion to approve the consent agenda as amended. Second. All right. Call the roll, please. Mr. Walston. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mayor Petrolia. Yes. Mr. Frankel. Yes. Ms. Cassell. Yes. Okay. And moving on to our first, um, Agenda item, which is coming off of consent, and um, that was for uh, 6E is now 7AA, settlement in the case of George Gretzis versus the city of Delray Beach, and this is um, removed by the vice mayor. Thank Deputy you. I vice just, mayor, I'm sorry. Yes, deputy, thank you. I just pulled that for Attorney Jellen to make a comment. I got a lot of inquiries on this item, people thinking that we were made an offer and we were accepting and what have you. There's, uh, We can only present limited uh, explanation to the public, but if you wouldn't mind giving an explanation to this item, I'd appreciate it. This item came before you at my recommendation. It's just a nominal settlement um, in order for the city to uh, essentially protect the taxpayer funds in the event that we prevail at trial. It is, it is nominal. We have not had any settlement discussions with Mr. Gretzis, and it's very early on in the case. Um, as you know, we did file a motion to dismiss in the matter. We are awaiting a court date from the court. And this is almost just this litigation strategy, so to speak. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. And I have a motion to. Um, motion to approve. Second. Call the roll, please. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Bolston? Yes. And we are now at 7A, which is the approval of resolution number 64-22, Ms. Maxfield. Hi. Actually, Madam Mayor, may I introduce? Sure. Thank you. So succinctly, this is nothing more than an agreement with CBRE for tenant broker and real estate consultancy services, essentially to serve as the city's procurement agent for P3 considerations regarding Derry Beach Municipal Golf Course, and I believe we have representatives from CBR here to make a presentation in terms of how this works. I thought it would be appropriate for me to offer a few introductory comments because given the uniqueness of considering public-private partnerships with municipal facilities and operations, particularly in the state of Florida, there are a number of moving parts associated therein, and after significant evaluation over the last few months and other considerations, it was determined that this would be in the best interest of the city to essentially expedite a process and involve you as a city commission to help us get to a place of solid recommendations to go forward. Also, benchmarking with other communities throughout South Florida, this has pretty much been the practice as well. So in essence, we did borrow from the playbook of a couple of the municipalities here in South Florida to help drive this recommendation forward. So with that, Director of Economic Development, Sarah Maxfield is with us, who will also introduce representatives from CBRE to offer a brief presentation as to how this all works. Before that, however, CBRE, for a good measure, is essentially the largest real estate or commercial real estate entity in not only the United States, but the entire world, as I understand it. So a lot of background and experiences to this effect and in terms of financial efficiency, this is a logical approach as well. Ms. Maxfield, if you would, please. Thank you. Um, good evening. 
uh, mayor, commissioners, staff, and guests. Sarah Maxfield, economic development for the city. Uh, before you is a resolution 6422 for an agreement with CBRE. The intent of this agreement is to piggy piggyback on a competitively bid state contract for consultancy services related to procuring a public-private partnership for the rehabilitation of the Delray Beach Municipal Golf Course with CR CBRE is a national, uh, as Manager Moore stated, national commercial real estate firm with significant experience in the public-private partnership arena. The city is seeking these services as a result of the city workshop that, was, uh, that happened in spring of 2021, at which the commission identified as a priority the rehabilitation and redevelopment of the municipal golf course lo located at 2200 Highland Avenue. The city of Delray Beach encourages the redevelopment of underdeveloped and underutilized properties through public-private partnerships where appropriate. Property structured, properly structured partnerships share the risk and expense amongst the public and the private partners. Securing the best partner for maximum city benefit requires a meticulous pre-development process, and this includes a robust marketing effort to find the best development partner. This public-private partnership is a complex structure that requires significant planning and subject matter expertise in real estate development, construction timelines, technical and financial analysis. If approved, CBRE will support the city in the preparation of the developer solic solicitation, broadly market this opportunity, perform financial and construction analysis, and negotiate the best transaction terms on behalf of the city. CBRE has submitted a proposal that was included in your backup materials, outlining specific services to be provided, and a creative fee structure that includes a cost recovery mechanism for the city when the project is completed. I'd like to introduce the two representatives here from CBRE's Public Institutions and Education Division, Leanne Course and Michael Mache. They have a brief presentation and are here to answer any clarifying questions that you may have. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Mayor, City Manager, and City Attorney, and members of the Commission. My name is Mike McShay, and as was uh, described to you a little bit earlier, I actually lead the public sector practice for CBRE nationally for state and local government. So I'm very pleased to be here. We're doing an awful lot of work here in South Florida. And a little bit about um, today, um, CBRE, thank you, CBRE is the largest commercial real estate company in the world. We have over 100,000 employees operating at $20 billion of transaction revenue per year. So we're a very, very large company. And we break the company up into areas of specialization. And our area of specialization, Leanne and mine, is working for state and local government all across the United States. We are also the largest commercial real estate services firm here in the state of Florida. And we had with us just a moment ago David Bateman, who is the manager of this part of Florida for us today. He had to leave to attend a board meeting. I apologize for that. But he was here earlier and would have loved to have been able to talk to you a little bit about what we have today. But you can see that we have 1,700 employees and 11 offices. We've been here for over 50 years and have a really significant presence in South Florida. A little bit about our group. I mentioned that I lead the Public Institution and Education Solutions Group. You can see where we're working today around the United States, really from coast to coast, very heavily concentrated with a lot of projects in Florida. And as Sarah mentioned a little bit earlier, you know, we do anywhere from 10, we have in process 10 to 15 public-private partnerships around the country at any given point in time. So what I'd like to offer you all is I think that we're going to be able to give you best of class of what your peer group is doing, give you the opportunity to really understand how the very best of public-private partnerships are formed around the country. A little bit about our understanding, um, you know, what, what I understand or Leanne and I understand you all are seeking to do is to maximize the opportunity at the golf course. You know, we will attract qualified developers. Shortly, you're going to hear from Leanne about the process that we employ. As the manager had mentioned, you know, that we go through when we seek public-private partnerships. We're going to do so in a way that we hopefully will minimize risk. Uh, increase value and basically support your negotiations with the developer all the way from the very beginning of the process through execution of contract documents. And so now what I would like to do is introduce to you Leanne Course, who is the South, uh, Southeast Regional Manager for our group, who's going to tell you a little bit about our process. Leanne? 
Sure, thank you, Mike. Uh, Leanne Korst with CBRE, and I'm, uh, as Mike said, I'm responsible for the Southeast Region Government Practice. So at the start of each one of these types of projects, we believe that engagement with you all and understanding your goals and your priorities is, is really of utmost importance. So we want to understand what has been done to date, what the deferred maintenance is or the deficiency in the capital needs for the golf course. And then we want to work with you to understand what your goals are for, for its redevelopment. Um, and, you know, we've even talked about um, coming back in, 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 in a commission workshop so that we can talk to you and get your feedback, um, understanding uh, it needs to be an open meeting and um, under sunshine. So um, that's sort of the due diligence that we'll want to do at the beginning of the project. Um, the left-hand column, and I know it's small print, but the left-hand column of this slide really outlines what we're going to be looking for um, in the developer solicitation. We want to understand who the, the developers are, who their development teams are, and really um, their development plan in great detail. So we have a proven process where we put together the solicitation. In some cities, it's called an invitation to negotiate. In some cities, it's called an RFP. We'll want to overlay whatever your procurement processes are with custom uh, world-class marketing materials to tell the story of Delray Beach. Um, uh, most of these development opportunities we treat as really understanding the culture of the community and what you want to accomplish. So we'll want developers to present a development plan, renderings, financial performance, um, and demonstrate their both their experiential and their financial ability to perform sources of debt and equity, for example. And then we'll want them to put, uh, put forth a development timeline and schedule um, and guarantees and risks uh, minimized to the city. So on the right-hand side of this slide, you'll see some statistics from two City of Hollywood offerings. One was an oceanfront redevelopment on city on land. The other was the Orange Brook Golf Course redevelopment, which is underway right now. The process is underway. There's going to uh, be developer presentations, six of them held in mid-May. But you can see the global reach here. Um, and, you know, in the, in the top right, there were 166 views of the marketing materials from in foreign countries, and in the bottom, 134. So it, it shows that we do reach uh, the market globally. And we will take those marketing materials that we create, paying attention to the time, um, and we'll make sure that they are pushed out to literally 25,000 plus investors, developers around the world. So that's a screenshot of the Hollywood project that we're working on right now. Um, but when those proposals come in, um, Mike says a lot of times, even though we ask for a specific transaction structure or bid structure, when they come in, you get an apple, an orange, and a squirrel. And though our job here is to, when those bids come in, compare them in a like-kind manner to, to the extent possible. So we'll want to do a cost study to look at their construction costs and compare to benchmark in the industry. We'll uh, do a schedule analysis, that development timeline that we asked for. We'll um, really check it to make sure that the critical path in the, in the schedule makes sense. Um, constructability, um, one of the things that we think is most important here is that the integrity of the Donald Ross design is maintained. That's important. And because of that, we've added National Golf Foundation to our team because we wanted that spe specific expertise. And then we'll do the financial analysis to really help your city evaluation team make an informed decision when they rank, score and rank the proposals. So here, here is the, the core team that we would utilize. Um, Mike and I are the pointy end of the spear. We have construction experts. We have someone from our financial consulting group. Um, should any of the property have commercial development, we would have multifamily or a hotel um, specialist on the team. And then, of course, Richard Singer from um, NGF. So I have about two minutes left. Um, here are a few case studies. We do, as Mike said, we do a lot of public-private partnerships. Everything from marinas to golf courses to really just mixed-use developments that are multifamily, retail, office, et cetera. So the left-hand side is Hollywood. 
And they received an unsolicited proposal and said, you know what, we, we need the course is too valuable. It's too important to our community. We want to broadly market it. So we put it out to, to bid and we received six different proposals. Um, we did the analysis and right now the developers are coming back to the city like I said, in, er, in early to mid-May to do presentations that are, that are open to the public so the public can see what's been proposed. They had very specific um, go bond requirements and also deed restrictions that um, developers had to um, propose on, lighted evening courses, things like that, walking trails, et cetera. So that's where we understand your priorities and it goes into the solicitation. Um, the city of Fort Myers, uh, that was a consulting project that we did to really help them understand the financials of the course and it too was a Donald Ross design so we do have a little bit of experience um, there. And then the bottom right case study is uh, the Downtown Investment Authority in Jacksonville and it's a mixed use development uh, where we went to market. It's a beautiful site um, adjacent to a, a planned city marina in downtown Jacksonville on the St. Johns River and it was just awarded to a developer out of Atlanta that's new to the um, Jacksonville market, but they are a very prolific uh, long-term Atlanta developer that believes in Florida, believes in Jacksonville, and is gonna spend $140 million on that project. So with that, I think we've maximized our time, and I'll stop and see if Mike has anything more to add. Happy to answer any questions you may have. Good. Commission? Anything? Good. You know, I, I do have a just it's kind of a question because I'm not I've never really been involved as long as I've been up here in a P3 situation. And we received, I think, a couple, if I'm not mistaken, of um, solicitations. And so it sounded almost like we would be moving backwards with the way that you work or because, well, let me just ask you this. If somebody's putting forward a you know a proposal if you start now coming to us asking us what we're looking for what if it is totally different because we, we weren't privy to that proposal we don't know what's in that proposal so I'm just trying to figure out it, it feels like the cart before the horse thing what why would you you know go there without us really knowing what they've brought maybe theirs is better or maybe they have a better idea as to what could be done because we're we, we don't know what they're offering how do you how do you marry that in my opinion, the cart before the horse is receiving an unsolicited offer before right. you identify your priorities. Well, we kind of have in a lot of settings. In other words, like for instance, we've been in situations where there's been a lot of discussion in workshops and in um, at our goal setting meetings in the past, those types of things. So I think that it was probably picked up on and run with from that perspective. That's why I'm just kind of trying to figure out how does this work with us? It's different maybe. Can I just piggyback sure, on sure. that? Sure, sure. I want to I see what comments you were going to make because we've been talking about this for sure. a while. Now. And um, we obviously want to provide guidance, which we, we have in public meetings, what we're looking for. But I think we weren't looking to get too detailed because we were hoping some professionals would bring some ideas to the table as well. Um, and so one of my concerns is that now we're going to go through this formal process. And I get why we're going to do it, and we've brought in the best to do it, and I think that's a great idea. But what I don't want is a very, very specific, you must do this, as we're trying to check my 12 boxes and her 8 boxes and her 16 boxes, and yep. et cetera. So I have that same, I have a, a similar concern, a concern I think, yeah. with what the mayor is putting forward. So, so how do we, to, how do we go to address that? yeah to address that so that that's a delicate balance because you want to make sure that the city's goals and priorities are met right mm -hmm. and you want to allow developers maximum creativity to bring the best ideas mm -hmm. so generally Hollywood and and their list of must-haves was pretty detailed because of the go bond because of the deed restriction more often than not what we do is we'll have a bulleted list of must-haves you need better drainage you need a better clubhouse whatever those five things are and then we'll say once you've met those minimum requirements bring your best ideas bring us your best and most creative ideas so it is a balance um, and each I would say each city that we work with has a little bit of a different approach to I want a laundry list of items versus 
I want those five things, and then you can be creative. Yeah, I, and Mike, I, I think yeah, you have to. Say I, I would just that. add that you know, I th one of the things that we do typically is we do a highest and best use analysis of the site. You know, a lot of times the city will say, "Well, we're going to build 100, you know, 100 residential units and 250,000 feet of retail space," and it has no basis of reality in the marketplace. You know, and that would be a failure for everybody. You know, so we'll do a highest and best use analysis. We'll come up with what we think the appropriate mix of uses is. What will be the best in terms of execution for the city, and then you all get to decide. You know, but we, you know, having the having the developers come in, the best and the brightest. I mean, we've had we just did one at uh, Johnson and Wales University. We had 20 offers on that site with some of the best really really developers in the in the world so we're very excited about this for you all think you have a great site and we're looking forward to contributing yes, I, I just like sure. to say that uh, I really feel that we might have talked around first of all thank you so much for being interested in coming to Delray uh, you're going to bring in expertise that the city unfortunately does not have I think this is just the latest iteration of um, expertise that a lot of cities don't have we have attorneys that we go outside and we get outside attorneys and this is just we we just don't have the expertise to develop our properties as we can well be aware uh, some of the um, things we've been trying to do have not been successful perhaps because of that um, I look forward to a first-class organization that if uh, just the idea that the city of Hollywood has done exactly what I believe we're doing. Now, I've been a part of a lot of goal settings. I do not, however, remember ever having a workshop asking, well, what do we want with that property? Uh, we've talked around it. Some of us have talked to some people who may have gone out and come back with something. Um, I have ideas that I'd like to share. I don't know how they're going to fit in that list of top five. I didn't even get to um, involve myself in it until I took a tour of our property. Mm -hmm. And I would dare say we are in desperate need of some help. And I look forward to working with you. Wonderful. Anyone else? Thank you. Sure. Um, thank you very much for uh, the presentation. And I, I read the, the backup, which is a little bit different than what you presented today. And to, uh, to piggyback on some of the comments already made, what I think is great about this proposal, and, and no disrespect to anyone at City Hall, but you have a network of uh, professionals that can you know, uh, hopefully give some good proposals for us to look at and see what fits. Uh, the, the history, the track uh, you have, particularly here in the state of Florida, with much larger projects, but also some golf courses and, and things of that nature, uh, you know, shows that you really, really do a, a, a marvelous job. So I will absolutely be in support of this. And thank you very much for coming forward. Thank you. Thank you. Your device. All set. Um, what, what kind of time frame are we talking about here from start to finish, roughly? So we can get started preparing the solicitation and the marketing materials right away. Okay. And I would say within a month, we could have those materials ready and ready to go to market. Um, we typically like to allow 90 days for developers to respond. These are complex projects, mm -hmm. and we want to give them team to cho or time to choose their development team and partners. Um, so we like to have that bid on the street for 90 days and then another month or two to evaluate the proposals. If we receive 16, like we did up in Jacksonville, then it takes a little bit longer to review the proposals than if we receive six. So I would say start to finish anywhere from seven to nine months. Typically, and we can move faster, what we find is that typically our public sector partners can't move as fast, especially if we want to do a commission workshop and some things like that. So. She always goes longer, I always go shorter. Well, the reason I say that is because it's been such a long time for our um, constituency. This is uh, the reason that I think some of my colleagues have never remembered a workshop is probably because it happened before their six years of, of being up here. Honestly, that's how long this has really dragged out. And it, I, I've been up here longer, except for maybe one person, the longest out of everybody. And I'm telling you, I just, I know that the patience of our 
community is just. There, we can work as fast as you need us to. All right, start. great. <laughs> that's that's wonderful to hear we because, can. truthfully, okay. I think that it's just one of those things where the delay tactics. We're now a decade in. Okay. And Madam Mayor, just to add, if I may, to help respond to that question, once authorization is granted, I look forward to engaging the team, the internal team, to sure. connect with CBR leadership beginning next week. Beautiful. So from there, I'll be able to coordinate direction to work with the city commission in terms of the respective input process so that we can expedite as well as we possibly can. Beautiful. That sounds great. All right. Motion Thank to you. approve. Second. All right. Call the roll, please. Mr. Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Boylston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Congratulations. Looking Thank forward. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for you. your presentation. You. All right. Moving on to resolution 4522, and this is a quasi-judicial hearing, so let me go ahead and read it into the record, <clears throat> our rules. This hearing shall be conducted in accordance with quasi-judicial rules. The applicant and the city shall be allowed 20 minutes each to present their case. The public shall be allowed to speak for three minutes each or a maximum of six minutes if the person representing an organization or a group of people who are present but agree not to speak. The city commission staff and the applicant may be allowed to cross-examine a witness. The city or the applicant will be allowed to offer rebuttal testimony. The decision to approve or deny an application or appeal may not be legally made upon a personal views as to whether a project is a good project or not, nor may a decision be based on the number of citizens who support or oppose a particular project. The law requires that all decisions must be made based on the basis of whether the project meets the requirement of law, the comprehensive plan, and the land development regulations. We have a swearing in of um, uh, uh, witnesses at this point, anybody who's planning on speaking for on resolution 4522, please stand and be sworn in. Very good. Ex parte communication from anybody on the commission. Let's start with uh, Deputy Vice Mayor. Out of the abundance of caution, I'm going to say the applicant, but I didn't speak to anyone directly based on what's here today. But just I would say the same. <laughs> okay. The applicant and at some point, but not regarding the current issue. Same here. Same. Okay, very good. Same. And then moving into um, entering the project um, file into the record. Anthea? Good evening, Anthea Genetis, Development Services Director. Um, I just do want to say that um, this item, Resolution 4522, um, the file for the record is 2021-069, which is a little different than what's on the screen, so let's be sure we note that. There are two, um, there are two actions. This one is a quasi-judicial action before you to abandon uh, a, an easement that, with the approval of the modification to Sunday Village, has shifted. Right. Um, the item directly following this is the plat, right. um, but this needs to occur first, so even though the plat's not really... So we're going to do it combined, so however. We're going to kind of explain them two together, but they do need to be separate Separately actions. done, and mm -hmm. also there should be public comment on the yes. first. And Christina Bolinski is here on behalf Good. of the applicant to give you an overview. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, good evening. For the record, Christina Belenke. My address is 14 Southeast 4th Street in Boca Raton, and I am standing in for Mr. Cavelli this evening. Um, so I know everybody is very familiar with the Sunday Village project. Um, these are really cleanup items. Uh, there were easements that were previously dedicated based on a certified site plan. Um, that site plan has since been revised, so certain pedestrian areas and vehicular areas have changed. Um, so we are essentially proposing to vacate the easements that are in conflict with the new plan and uh, dedicate the new easements through plat. Um, so just a very quick overview, the plat includes blocks 61, 62, 69, and 70. Mm -hmm. And this is just the cover sheet that meets the technical requirements for the plat. Um, here we have the pedestrian easement that is being proposed to be abandoned. Again, this was uh, dedicated previously based on the previously certified site plan. Um, there is another pedestrian easement proposed to be abandoned on your screen in the peach. And then here uh, in the yellow is a pedestrian, a pedestrian and vehicular easement uh, that will be dedicated. And then in green, uh, there's the start of a pedestrian easement dedication um, that will continue on the next screen. Also in red, those are uh, roadway dedications that will be made through the plat. 
And here you have that continuation of the pedestrian easement dedication and the, uh, again, right-of-way dedications in red uh, that are going to be occurring through the plot. And just to show you uh, kind of over an overview, um, an aerial image of the project, again, the yellow is the vehicular and pedestrian easement area, and the green is the pedestrian easement area that will be dedicated through the plot. Um, again, more right-of-way dedications are highlighted in red. And uh, per the staff report, I would just refer you there for uh, showing compliance of the required findings um, and code requirements for approval of a plot application and the abandonment as well. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Good. Anthea? Sure. So, so ultimately, um, the, the graphics by the applicant are better than mine, so I, I don't think that I need to show you less colorful images of the same easements. Um, but ultimately, what's before you is that by to abandon this, the uh, configuration of the previous pedestrian vehicular easements that were adopted through sort of like a separate instrument, the finding before you is um, that you would um, agree to grant of the abandonment of the easement by finding that it will not result in the detriment for the provision of utility services for the project. Ultimately, the replacement of these is now holistically shown on the next item on your agenda, which is the plat, which shows all of these items sort of neatly tied up in to right away is the new location of the easements and um, the new alley coming through, if you recall, um, mm -hmm. on the other block, all of that is now shown on the plat in one instrument together. So your finding right now is that, no, we don't need this vehicular pedestrian easement that we are party to for utilities, and then we'll go to the next item, which is the plat, which handles everything for the project as it was recently approved. Very good. Okay. Um, the... Um, we are now opening up to uh, public comment. If anybody would like to speak to um, the uh, resolution 4522, please step forward, state your name and address, and you have three minutes. And seeing no one, um, public comment on this issue is closed. So we're going to move to um, cross-examination or rebuttal. Do we have either? And both um, applicant and the city states no. Um, and uh, there is no... Um, Cross-examination then either, I presume, no. All right, to the, to the commission for discussion. If not, any discussion to entertain a motion? Motion to approve. Second. Call the roll, please. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Boston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Resolution 43-22? This, this doesn't really require a lot of... Um, Comment because this is really ministerial. This would have been on your consent agenda. So. Motion to approve. Second. Is that enough comments? Perfect. Any any <laughs> discussion? <laughs> Seeing none, call the roll. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Bolston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. All right, thank you very much. And we're moving on to 7D, which is the temporary use of outdoor areas. Uh, good evening, and the Engineerist Development Services Director um, for the record. Um, so I do want to make a couple distinctions about what we're here to talk about based on the public comment that you heard. Mm -hmm. um, so when we entered into um, the COVID um, sort of lockdown situation, um, we moved very quickly to allow a lot of our businesses to establish outdoor use areas that they normally wouldn't have. Right. Um, we also allowed our restaurateurs to expand their sidewalk cafes in front of adjacent tenants and no, they weren't charged for this extra spreading out. Right. Um, we allowed our standalone bars to utilize outdoor space and um, we allowed other private outdoor use expansions that we would normally assess parking for or require a site plan. And so we've kind of rolled this project, this um, program a couple of times. Um, I do want to make it clear that um, we made the decision, I think the last time we revisited this program, the decision and direction was made to go ahead and start collecting fees for the sidewalk cafes. And I think it's important to note that the code today allows um, the permittee to use the property in front of an adjacent business with permission. So 
sunsetting the temporary outdoor use area um, would not take away those expansions in front of other tenant spaces assuming that they've gone through the process and they're paying and they have the the legal permission from the adjacent tenant so those would stay those may stay under the city's pre-existing conditions you know the, the code that we had in place prior to the temporary outdoor use areas you just okay. you do have to go make sure that you're you know, process your neighborhood and community services and you're paying for the square footage of the sure. sidewalk area you're using. Mm -hmm. So I just want to make that really clear that when we're talking about this, that doesn't take away that possibility because um, chapter, um, I think it's chapter five already, I wrote it on the wrong piece of paper, chapter six already allows that possibility with cooperation from your neighbor. What we're here to talk about are um, some of the standalone bars are still utilizing outdoor spaces, um, and a couple of restaurants are utilizing outdoor areas as well. The last time we discussed this program, um, it was gonna have a May 1st sunset. Um, we do have one um, applica application that has been in process to consider um, allowing uh, the two COP standalone bar to have an outdoor use area. Um, we had intended to bring that back tonight, but um, we haven't finalized it. And um, I'm concerned that the applicant's agent may not be able to make the next meeting. Um, she's gonna have yep. a baby or two. <laughs> so so I, I wasn't sure how to proceed, whether we go ahead and sunset on May 1st, everyone, you know, it's over, go back inside or come in for your site plan amendment and assess your parking as usual. Um, the standalone bars do not have an avenue for maintaining any outdoor use area currently, and so is it time to go back into the building? Or do you want to um, tell us that those that are moving, to, that maybe have an application in process don't have to go away until they're done processing? Or do we um, just ha establish a new sunset date, and this time we really mean it? You know, <laughs> So I, I'm not sure what to do, and so I'm looking for direction today. I can tell you that um, some of some of the um, the the um, people who took advantage or the businesses that took advantage are no longer using the program. We have a series that, um, particularly once the sidewalk cafes started to charge and this and that, you know, they didn't take advantage of extending it and they're no longer using it. Um, you know, we've had um, one noise complaint, but on one business only, and um, they were they're listed as invalid. So I don't know what really what that means. I don't know. Um, Everybody else is not. So there's still a range of, of folks that may still be using theirs, um, including some standalone bars, including um, some yoga places, things like that. And so we're just really looking for direction, whether we're sunsetting at May, in which case we need to send notice so everybody remembers that it was temporary, or if we're establishing a new date, or if we're doing something in between. If I can start out, I mean, I, I think that it made me feel good that you said that these businesses that are along some of the ave the avenue and other areas that are occupying in front of building buildings that are no longer or they don't have a you know um, a tenant right now like Buddha bar um, you know that uh, you know we were just had uh, mr. Herbst in here talking about how he's extended his tables down in front of Buddha bar and that's really actually great because it does give that appearance of being active and not down. And I think that's really important for our city. And I am glad to hear that that's, this is not gonna affect that. As long as they're paying for those bases and they're following the rules as per outdoor seating. Um, that said, um, when we get into standalone bars, um, to me, you know, depending on where they are, I think we've had this issue. Um, fact that we've got one going through i think that that should uh, hold off on doing anything with with uh any anyone that's in the process of trying to change we can always change that later for them but right now i don't feel like that would be a fair thing to have them close down a lot of the stuff that they've put out there is very expensive uh, we heard about that they needed at least several months if you remember that's what they were saying don't cut this off too soon because we're making an investment here which we understood and it's been longer than what they had in anticipated and asked for anyway so we're we're good with that so to me not i don't think we should rock that boat yet until we get past that point 
However, I do believe that it is time to sunset. Um, I, I, I think that um, you know, with standalone bars, uh, the ones that are not going through the process or are uh, you know, backing up to um, residential, uh, we just really shouldn't be having outdoor activities after a certain hour. People have the right to peace and enjoyment and quiet in their houses. And um, the, the really the crux of our you know, COVID times have, has passed. Uh, nobody's really wearing masks. Everybody's out in mass, um, you know, on the avenue and other places. So I don't think of that. But the one thing also that is bothering me is that there are some that have moved into their own parking lots, mm -hmm. which means that they don't even have the parking that they originally had to have in order to be able to qualify for being a mm -hmm. restaurant with a certain num number of parking spaces. I'm not necessarily opposed to considering something different there. Mm -hmm. However, they have to pay for their parking, whether it's in lieu or somehow, because it doesn't make any sense to have one group have to pay for it and they're not because they were able to slip in through COVID. So that I think we need to really focus on and make sure that we're not taking away parking um, now indefinitely um, where parking is prime and important to our city functioning. It's one of the biggest gripes we always hear about. So that's where I kind of stand and I'd you know, like to hear what the rest of my commission has to say. Yes, ma'am. I agree with you totally, but I think we should give another extension of time. Okay. And then I just, the COVID numbers are, you know, that we know there's a rise of COVID while we've determined it may not be as detrimental if you're vaccinated. I'm still dining outside. I really don't want to be inside unless I have to. I'm with you on the fact that it's a little concerning our parking situation. I definitely think if it, we should be charging for parking, but I think let's move it one more time. Okay. Maybe go, you know, June, July, maybe even August, and then start. Well, now we're going, getting closer and closer to season, which is going to be, hey, listen, we need to get to season. I think you really have to pull the Band-Aid off or not. I mean, I think that we're going to really, we're never going to get to that point. I thought uh, May was good because people are leaving. It's end of season, and it causes every, it, it, there's not as going to be as much interest in dining outside any longer because of the heat. It's getting hotter. Yeah, so to me, that's the reason why. I wouldn't mind doing 30 days, but I yeah. think that if you're going right through the summer, there's going to be no reason why you shouldn't go through the fall and the winter and everything else again. So yeah, I question if it's going to really get quieter, though. I think we're in a new place where people are moving here and staying. I don't think it's there's as hot. much movement back and forth. But you want to say a, a 30 day? Let's see what everybody else has to say. I don't know. <laughs> I'll uh, yes, I'll jump in. So, you know, when I um, reviewed the agenda, I can't remember if it was with Mr. Moore or Miss Jellen. But was staff going to recommend keeping it keeping it in place? Is that staff's recommendation? I think, in light of the fact that there is an ordinance that's coming before you that's going to address a lot of this, I would probably recommend maybe sunsetting it at the second reading, and then okay. because at that point they would have the ability to, if if the ordinance gets approved, then they can go through the process to get an approval, and if the ordinance fails, well, then at that point, you know, everything is exhausted. When do we think that is? That's the one That's where the million dollar question. Right, it depends. The baby. Right, babies. Yeah. I, I, I'll, I'll say <laughs> I don't, that. I don't um, see it going before June, to be honest with you. Right. Yeah, and, and, and for me, the uh, months of August and September, they're the toughest months for our, for our restaurants, for our hospitality industry in general. Um, significant, it's not, a, it's not a small decrease during those two months. And you see it every year, um, the DDA does restaurant I think it was restaurant day, then week, now it's restaurant month, uh, just to support them through those times. And uh, I, I think uh, Deputy Vice Mayor uh, Casal brought up a good point just in regards to in regards to COVID, in regards to is there really an off season? So I would be in support of continuing at least through those months. We'll have some clarification um, on staff's recommendation, of course, in regards to the ordinance that'll be in place. Um, so. I would like to extend it through through um, August. I mean October, so through September and August, and by that time we'll have that clarification. That would be my recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. I support you wholeheartedly. I think the more that we 
inch along and inch along and extend it. The next thing you know, it's going to be this time next year. And I won't be here. So I would like to say we have some bars that are going to have problems. We were having them before the pandemic. And if we, I don't know that they're all in that mix of having gone into the parking lot or or just what they've done. The one in particular that I will not name is uh, right on top of the, um, the residence. Mm -hmm. And my biggest concern is that once we start allowing this, it gets more and more difficult to rein it back in. Mm -hmm. I would be in favor of maybe another 30 days. The heat's gonna overtake us. No one's gonna wanna sit outside, perhaps. But uh, we need to start saying what we are going to do and stick with it and stop making so many exceptions in order to allow someone to set up an establishment that our ordinances and our land uses don't allow, but we keep making waivers and exceptions and everyone gets to do that. And after a while, our laws don't mean anything to anybody. So. June 1st, perhaps, and I'm done. Uh, this is a great conversation. Um, yeah, first, I like having staff recommendation. I can't tell you the last time I've had a staff recommendation, so well, I've missed those. We used to have them on every item. Um, Second. <laughs> so, you know, I, I see somewhat this on a case-by-case -case basis. City Oyster, I think they succeed in front of the closed business next door. Absolutely. Um, I think, uh, was it Granger's? use their parking lot but you know they're not doing they it got plenty of they're not even doing it anymore no. but they were doing it and I can kind of see that but I could kind of see it in other places it wasn't successful mm -hmm. the one issue I have it's related to this but it's part of a larger picture is two or three times a week I go to my office on southeast first and there's empty alcohol bottles in front of my office door mm -hmm. there's garbage piling up all over the place and I don't I, we have a lot of good men and women uh, on the streets early in the morning, but it's just like so much that they can't even you know, take part in it. So I'll go along with staff's recommendation. I think they're, the comments are valid that we got to start reining this in a little bit. Um, I'm flying out Thursday. I'm still going to wear a mask, but I guarantee you I'm going to be in the 50%. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, oh, yeah, it's an ever-changing situation. Uh, I think it's good to have options and outdoor uh, dining certainly has been an option, uh, but also with outdoor dining, it's a little different than outdoor uh, alcohol consumption in that you know, it tones down to 10 o'clock. You know, people aren't really eating at one in the morning unless you're a Dada. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I I'm fine with the staff recommendation, uh, but I think it's time to start reining it in. We can always bring it back. If we Didn't need they have several recommendations? What was their? Well, well Mayor, one of the options. Options. Mayor, can I make a recommendation? I'm sorry, who am I speaking to? <laughs> oh. Who's talking? Lynn. Oh, Lynn. Somebody I'm over sorry. there. I heard somebody over there too. It was me, but I'm oh. waiting. <laughs> so well, I was just yeah. going to recommend. We know this ordinance is coming back for second reading. You know, our goal is to get it before you in June. What about sunsetting it 30 days after second reading? And at that point, you can say they'll have to get an application into sure. the city within those 30 days. And if you do, then you're grandfathered in. And if the ordinance is denied, then you have 30 days to close shop. I just I ultimately, too, I, I just do want to make it really clear that if you are a restaurant, you are allowed to do outdoor dining. It just means you have to park it. Right, so, absolutely. And, and got to figure that out. Now, right. there are other uses like the standalone bars, and there's two. I think both the sale in, well, actually the sale in, I'm not sure if the OG is a restaurant yet or not. They were transforming. They closed and, yesterday because they're yeah. making all the improvements. So, um, you know, they're the ones that the code doesn't accommodate that option. Of Isn't Porn Famous also one of them too? Or theirs, no? theirs was revoked, but they're moving into a full restaurant as okay. well. Was there was always their end game? I think the gotcha. COVID impact financially um, was bothering was was impacting their schedule. So then there's you know so there's um, our restaurants who can have an outdoor use right now. Outdoor dining is allowed, but you have to mitigate your impacts. The sidewalk cafe ordinance today allows you to go in front of your neighbor if you have a notarized form that gives mm -hmm. you permission from them that it's okay that you're in front of their business. Pardon me, Anthea, and then the other thing is we don't let you. Like 
I'm sorry? How many restaurants are like that? How many restaurants are taking? They have permission to go with their neighbors. I know there's two we talked about. Um, I'm, 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 trying, yeah, I'm trying to others. look. Um, I have a list, but I can't tell. Maybe Laura could tell us right off the top of her head. Okay. Um, I, there's, there are not that many that are that actually are legal. Yeah, Laura said 10 this, to 15. But um, I don't know. <laughs> you, honestly, Sammy and I can come up with a list for you the next time we consider this, I suppose. Um, you know, Johnny Brown's, I think, is one as well. Mm -hmm. But um, the other distinction is that our usual sidewalk cafe ordinance doesn't allow you, if you're on a corner, to use both sides. You have mm -hmm. to pick a side. We would loosen that up as well. So some of it is position that would not be accommodated under the current code others are but you need to just go through the application process and i think most most of them have done it because we required the notarization under the temporary program as well so i'm sure those that are stretched out are legally stretched out because our city attorney made sure we had all the hold harmlesses so it's really the uses that or the parking impact that would have to be resolved for the use expansion on private property um, outdoor alcohol requires a code of ordinances amendment and that's part of what you'll consider with the two COP I can tell you that if they're successful the four COP is one of those will probably be bringing it forward we're waiting to see how the other one right goes first so okay so right. so do, do you want to do a, a motion with respect to what uh, the motion with respect to what city attorney Jellin <laughs> Adam, like uh, was very eloquent thank you was it uh, 30 days sunset, sunset after second, second reading. Second reading. 30 days sunset after second reading, yes. Okay. Second. Call the roll, please. Mr. Bolston? No. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. M Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? No. Okay. Moving on to public hearings, we've got an ordinance 1222. An ordinance of the City Commission of the City of Delray Beach, Florida, updating the capital improvement plan schedule and the comprehensive plan of the City of Delray Beach for fiscal year 2021-22 to fiscal year 2025-26 to in accordance with the requirements of policies CIE 1.21 and CIE 1.26 of the capital improvement element, as more particularly described in Exhibit A, providing a conflicts clause, providing a severability clause, authority to codify, providing an effective date, and for other purposes. And this is second reading. Um, so this is actually uh, more of a housekeeping item than anything else. Um, when um, we adopted our capital improvements plan last year, we did that with the resolution, with the budget and other things. However, the CIP actually is part of the comprehensive plan. And so it is required to be adopted every year by ordinate, ordinance, not just reso. And um, when the next item started to go through the process with South Florida Water Management and DEO, they were the ones who noted we hadn't used their preferred um, you know, mechanism for adopting it. There's nothing that this will do that will change any of what was adopted through that resolution. And we will make sure that we run the ordinance through the Planning and Zoning Board for the next budget to avoid this cleanup in the future. Um, Planning and Zoning Board did see this item um, at its March 21st meeting and um, recommend, recommended approval unanimously. Very good. Any commission? Motion motion? To approve. motion to approve. Second. Call the roll. Oh, I'm sorry, it is a public hearing. Hold on. It is. Yep. Um, so before we move forward, anybody from the public that would like to speak to Ordinance 1222, please step forward, state your name and address, and you have three minutes. Mr. Hajimiri, are you coming forward? No, 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 no. Okay, all right, just, I don't, wanna, I don't wanna slam the gavel on you, okay? Uh, public hearing uh, is closed. We have a, a, a motion and a second. Call the roll, please. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Boylston? Yes. All right, moving on to Ordinance 24-21. An ordinance of the City Commission of the City of Delray Beach, Florida, adopting a comprehensive plan amendment and updating the 10-year water supply facilities work plan pursuant to the provisions of the Community Planning Act, Florida Statute Section 163.3184, as more particularly described in Exhibit A entitled Always Delray Comprehensive Plan Amendment, Ordinance Number 24-21, and incorporated herein by reference, providing a conflicts clause, providing a severability clause, authority to codify, and providing an effective date. This too is second reading. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Mayor, Commissioners, Hassan Hajimeri Utilities Department. Um, 
What is a water supply plan? Water supply plan is an assessment of the water system's current and future demands. This must be done once every 10 years and updated once every five years. Uh, this, gives, this is a tool that um, gives the ability to the municipality or public water supplier to make sure that there is enough water available for the future demand. City of the Ray Beach provide um, water service to within the service area, which is 16.5 um, square mile, and some small areas outside of the city boundary, and also town of Gulf Stream. There are some small pockets within the cities uh, that are also um, are unincorporated, and city provide water to just portion of it, not to the entire area within the uh, within those hashed area. <clears throat> The water supply for uh, the city comes from 30 wells. As you see here, there are um, five different well fields, uh, four of them within the city, and there are three wells outside of the city located in Morokami Park. Uh, within the city, we have Eastern Well Field, which is on north and south side of the Atlantic uh, Avenue around um, Swinton. There are um, nine wells within the uh, golf course, municipal golf course, and also six on the east side of the I-95. So total of 30 wells, and these are the sole source of the drinking water for the city. In order to um, assess the uh, projection for our water demand, we looked at the um, population within the city of the Ray Beach, Gulf Stream, and also the portion of the unincorporated area that we serve. We utilized the data that was developed by the Lower East Coast Water Supply, Water Supply Plan and American Community Survey. We also used the data, city's data, for the past five years in order to come up with our projections. We also have four interconnect with the municipalities surrounding the uh, city of the Ray Beach, which are the city of Boynton, Palm Beach County, town of Highland, and Boca Raton. And these are the emergencies interconnect only. If you do need peep, uh, water or other municipality within the close proximity of our interconnect needs water. In order to come up with our projection, um, as I mentioned, we utilized the uh, data for the past five years. As you see, we put the number here for 2018 and 2020. Those are the population on the first uh, row from city of the Ray Beach. Uh, we're projecting that in year 2030, uh, the city itself would have 75,835 people, and in 2040, about 80,500. Considering the population from town of Gulf Stream, which is uh, pretty much constant, uh, not that much increase in that area, and so as unincorporated area, there we go. Uh, the bottom line on that uh, great area is the number of the people that we use for our projection. So that would be 74,021 people for 2025. 78,374, which is approximately 4,000 people in five years, and another uh, 5,000 for the next 10 years after that. So between the 74,000 to 83,000, with uh, about 9,000 uh, people adding to the city's uh, service area. So we took those numbers and we utilize the uh, per capita use. Those are, that's the water that, based on a history of the fa past five years, every customer uses as an average, which is 216.5 gallons per day. This is pretty high. This number is high, and we are trying our best to bring this uh, number lower, as we discussed uh, last week with our um, irrigation scheduling and also tiered water rating, hoping that we can get that water hopefully below um, 200. 
if not lower. So when you multiply the amount of water that each person uses by the population, you come up with the amount of water that you need every single day. So that's average daily demand, which for 2025 is 16, 2030 is 17, and 2040 is 18 million gallons, <coughs> excuse me, per day. And those are rounded, so 17, it could be 17.3 or 17.5, so for uh, simplicity, I rounded to the uh, zero decimal. We're hoping that uh, we can utilize reclaimed water for some of those demand, knowing that uh, the new population, they will need water for irrigation. So we're hoping that we can offset that demand by 0.8 million gallons in 2030 and 2040. So that actually reduces their, our demand to 15 and a half, 16.2 and 17.2 uh, until year 2040. So why do we do all that? We wanna see how much raw water do we need. So we wanna make sure we have enough water supply. And we know that the, when the raw water comes to the treatment plant, we lose some of that water during the process, which is approximately 3% of that water. So uh, when you multiply those number uh, by 1.03, you come up with the raw water demand, which is for 2030 is 16.7, and for 2040 is 17.8 million gallons per day. That's how much water we need to have water supply in order to make sure that we have enough water for our customers. Currently, our consumptive use permit is 19.1 million gallons per day from South Florida Water Management District. So comparing those two numbers, we have uh, about 2.4 million gallons for 2030 and 1.3 for 2030 um, raw water supply available. This uh, graphic shows uh, basically the location of uh, our surficial aquifer, which is between 85 to probably 150 feet below ground level. That's where most of our water comes from. Uh, 29 wells out of those 30 wells bring in water from the surficial aquifer. We have one ASR well that is not being utilized. That brings water from Florida aquifer, which is about 1,100 feet deep. So brief summary, um, as I mentioned in 23, 2040, our demands are uh, around 16.7 uh, to 17.8, which I uh, simple it out to 18 million gallons per day. And we have 19.1 uh, available capacity. So it, it does meet the demand. Uh, and this plan was reviewed by South Florida Water Management District and their comments were incorporated. Uh, Thank so you. That's all I have to say. Thank you. All right, once again, this is a um, public hearing, so if there's anybody that would like to speak to Ordinance 24-21, please step forward, state your name and address. Seeing no one, um, public comment on this is closed to the commission. I have a question for you. It's very, just it has nothing to do with what I'm, you know, obviously this is um, important, we pass. But um, we have one well that goes down deep into the Florida aqu Floridian aquifer. Yes, Florida, that's the ASR well, aquifer storage recovery. Um, that well actually is located just north of uh, the city hall, uh, right next to that north pump station. Okay, and does it, is there a difference in the water quality that comes from the deeper um, that aquifer? That well, well, that actually bringing up the brackish water. Oh, interesting. It is a brackish water. It is not the it is, it is not the surficial. So it's, it's a totally different um, water quality that comes up. Usually, you utilize that kind of water when you have a reverse osmosis, when you have a RO. But that well was drilled, I think, 20 years ago or so. At that time, South Florida Water Management District, they were very interested with this ASR. So many municipalities, they drilled those wells, but unfortunately, most of them are not being utilized. Seems like a very expensive well to drill that it you was, aren't using. It usually is. And South Florida, I'm pretty sure, 
at the time of the installation, they provided some grant to have that, because they were promoting uh, the ASR. And the reason I ask that, that just is from the standpoint of the PFASs that are leaching into our uh, everybody's water supply in South yes. Florida and Florida in general, um, and other supplies as well, um, does it reach those deeper levels? Is, is that something that you would not see at that deeper level that you do see at the I, surface level of waters? I doubt it if you see it at, at that level because of the confining layer, which... I, yep. uh, I saw that. There we go. There's a confining layer mm -hmm. between the uh, surfacial and uh, floor and aquifer. Probably grabs it before yes. it gets down there. Yes. Okay. But the plan is hopefully with a new water plant, um, majority of the PFOS level will be removed. Right. Well, yes. that's through our filtration system that we're going right. to incorporate regardless, correct? Uh, as part of the nanofilt correct, nano filtration I mean. treatment process, yes. Great. All right, thank you very much. That's all the questions I had. Anyone else? Yes. Just um, for the public information, though, our PFAS numbers are well below. Yes, ma'am. The, the PFAS is a 70 part per trillion, and that's a health advisory level. Mm -hmm. Right. That is not the mean, that's, that's not the MCL. Mm -hmm. MCL is a law. That's one thing that we have to go with. Right. Um, but for instance, the lead, copper, those have an MCL. But PFAS has a health advisory level. And until that is adopted by the EPA, that actually will say, well, this is your limit, then at that time, um, entire country needs to obey by that. But right now, uh, our numbers are way below 70 part per trillion for PFOA and PFOS. Mm -hmm. And those are the only two that you have to add to come up with that number. Mm -hmm. Because when you sample the water, it comes up with, I think, 17 or 18 different PFOS, but EPA, only regulates, not regulates actually, set a health advisory level for those two combining together. Gotcha. Thank and, you. But hopefully as we move forward, I hope we're all on the same page as doing even better than what is required. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, yes. Um, the, the plan is hopefully to get this uh, with the nano filtration, uh, the way we design it to be less than a 20. That's mm -hmm. what we are aiming for. Excellent. But again, PFOS is something that has been done many, many years ago mm -hmm. by many industries uh, in the ground. It's, it's not something that we do at the plant, or it's oh. not something that the resident do it. It's just there. Right. Well, it's um, through chemical processes over yeah. the years that have right. filtered down through the mm -hmm. different um, you know, layers of our ground into our groundwater, and it's not specific to Delray Beach. It's everywhere, it's everywhere, and it's what we have to deal with and contend with because of how we're living and what our expectations are on certain things like even pizza boxes. That actually, you know, contributes to um, this, this, uh, you know, this chemical. Right. True. And we did, and we did in City of Delray Beach. We voluntarily tested PFOS that no other city had done. I thank you for that. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. So, um, if there's no other questions, entertain a motion. Motion to approve. Second. Call the roll. Mr. <coughs> Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Boylston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. And we have a first read, Ordinance 1022. An ordinance of the City Commission of the City of Delray Beach, Florida, amending the land development regulations of the City of Delray Beach Code of Ordinances, Chapter 4, Zoning Regulations, Article 4.7, Family Workforce Housing, Section 4.7.6, Rental Housing Units, modifying the permissible maximum rent for each income category, amending Section 4.7.7 for sale housing units to align the maximum sales price requirements with state standards, amending Section 4.7.8, resale and subsequent rentals of affordable units, modifying the permissible conveyance of properties with restrictive covenants, amending Section 4.7.11, density bonus tables, deleting the section in its entirety, and renumbering Section 4.7.12, other incentives to reflect the de de deletion of Section 4.7.11, providing a conflicts clause, providing severability clause, authority to codify, and providing an effective date. Um, this is first reading, so you will not have a presentation on this. Day. Right. So just a question for you, um, uh, uh, Ms. Jellin. Is, is this, we know that there was a difference in the county to us, and it looks like we're taking out our section and putting in the states. Are we, are we let, no? Okay. Yeah. 
Anthea, can, oh, I'm sorry. Hi, Anthea Genotis Development Services Director. So um, the um, when we had a workshop on affordable housing, mm -hmm. and I think um, we have a lot of work to do in that aspect, but one of the low-hanging fruit that was identified at that workshop was that the city's ordinance currently allows, uh, for example, language at, um, that's being stricken through this ordinance on page two, um, units targeted uh, for the moderate income household at 81 to 120 of an area median income can actually have a rental rate that doesn't exceed 140. And it was the same thing for 61 to an 80% AMI. We had a step in our code um, that the that's current we're, staff we're doesn't understand why we would allow yeah. an, a workforce unit to charge beyond what the income level is and we're setting up our households for, for financial stress. And so that was a direction to remove that immediately. Yeah, so that's what you're seeing before you now. Um, the bulk of what is being struck out just in terms of pages are example density tables. They're just illustrative of how it works. It. And our intention is to move that maybe onto an information page of the website. It's not really regulatory, so it was, it was a lot of, of code pages that wasn't code. Um, and then there's a few updates in terms of inheritance and transfer of title through families of those um, units which are deed restricted traditionally, so. Very good, thank you. Entertain a motion. Motion to approve. Second. <coughs> Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Bolston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Petrolia? Yes. Um, on to comments and inquiries of non agenda items. Mr. Moore? Thank you. One item briefly. Via the April 8, 2022 City Commission information letter, I advised the Commission relative to the Initial anticipated time frame for a selection process for solid waste and recycling services throughout the community. I initially contemplated a that to be initiated in the month of June to offer recommendations in September. We are actually prepared and queued up to proceed a lot faster than that within the next couple of weeks. So we're looking at the beginning of May, enabling recommendations to be brought to the City Commission by August. So I just wanted to offer that clarification for good measure. And again, we have the work necessary to proceed accordingly. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? No? No, ma'am. The attorney? Um, just a reminder that on Thursday, I'm going to have the public noise workshop. It'll be in the chambers here at 6 o'clock. It is not a city commission workshop. I apologize for the confusion. It is, it's meant for the public to come in. Our outside <laughs> consultant will be here. He's going to provide the public with some of his um, preliminary results from the sound studies that he's done. And we are also going to be seeking volunteers to go on sound walks. Um, they'll occur on two different evenings, and they'll be an hour long. So if anybody's interested, you can email me or call the city attorney's office. Um, and that's it. So we're not going to be here for that? or You're welcome to, but it's not, not a, required. It's, it's not required. Got it. He's very interesting, so I would recommend coming. Well, is he coming to us too to do the same, or is it going so we would be seeing it a second time, or is this going to be different? What you're going to see is the draft ordinance um, in a pub, in a workshop first, so that you can you know provide your feedback and and give us some direction as to decibel levels and things like that. This is a little bit more informative as to the processes that he's employed thus far and what he's going to be doing in the near future. And at 6 p.m. on Thursday, let me double check. Is it going to be on YouTube? The reason why I ask is it's not in the pack up. It's at six o'clock. I did not plan on live streaming it, but I can speak with IT about that. I don't need to cause any problems for the you know, three of us that <laughs> <laughs> watch these things live. <laughs> don't worry about it. Very good. Well, thank you. All right, so to the, anything else? All right, to the commission. Let's start on this end. I'm sorry? Um. He already did his. No, he did. He mentioned that um, the waste management contract is going to be starting earlier than anticipated. No problem. Yes, sir. Mary, you had mentioned the Vista Del Mar and Andrew's yes. conversation uh -huh. that uh, was brought up during public comments. I mm -hmm. think that might be a good item to include in our, our, goal, our goal setting. Absolutely. Well, I think that would be part of a CIP project that we, we need to put in play. Absolutely. And I think that we've talked about it for I don't know how long. And Everything always seems to kind of jump in front because, but it's so busy there now. I think yeah, it really is dangerous. important. I mean, it's really a safety. It's yeah, not a convenience. I agree. It's not a convenience. Uh, now, I think that we're going to run into some real issues there, just as we have in some of the other districts, like the um, Marina District, Historic District, where people's houses, or, you know, especially when you get closer to 
um, to Atlantic on Andrews. There are houses and driveways um, that are right along the road and it, it impacts their ability to park. So that's all gonna have to be worked out. But we had the same issue on George Bush Boulevard too with all of those um, different um, angles of drives and whatnot. So mm -hmm. I, somebody can figure it out, I'm sure. It's, okay. it's not like recreating the wheel. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. Let's have that added if we can to discuss. It's a bigger topic than staff can just go Absolutely. And address. Yes, ma'am. Um, yes, sir. I was wondering if there would be a consensus to discuss a building safety inspect inspection ordinance. I know we were waiting on the county and state. State's not coming through clearly. Um, I don't know, haven't received an update from the county. Um, our neighboring city did step out with their own, so there would be kind of a model. I heard other cities are now looking at that model that we're waiting like we were. Um, I don't, I'm just curious if. I brought that up, I don't know how many times it doesn't, there was never an appetite for it, it felt like, but I don't know why we, we couldn't even go May to I? them and uh, ask, just real quick, ask um, them to maybe pay for their services to come down and take a look at our, in other words, not create another, you know, um, heavy load on our, um, but, but share in the cost possibly, but anyway, yes. I think at the meeting where I um, asked for us to give Mr. Moore direction, that was one of the items, an ILA with BOCA to share the services to inspect the buildings. I don't know that we need to go all the way through an ordinance. I think we might have to adopt something by reference. We would have to have yeah. our own. We'd have to. I, I think you got consensus. Yeah. I mean, okay. I, I think we're all. On board. I was trying to be patient. I know, yeah. Ms. Jalen, that, that was one of your recommendations. Is yep. um, I, I think the uh, ILA is is a good route if BOCA is willing to do it. If Boca is not willing to do it, you, you know, you're going to have to make some very serious considerations regarding, mm -hmm. you know, inserting yourself um, with liability potentially, right. as well as proper staffing. Okay. Right. I, that's, that's always a concern because you can adopt anything. Right. But if you don't have the staff that's able to enforce this, and I'm sure Anthea can tell you <clears throat> that in the building department, it's hard to find inspectors as Absolutely. it is. And so add this additional level. But I do think, and I know the mayor and I had spoken about the ILA with Boca. No, I think that's a great idea, but obviously we don't have that many be... buildings. I mean, no, we really don't. We don't. So that's yeah. why I'm saying to create something where we actually now have a whole hired staff for this, right? Th for such a sh small number that it might be better just to help them with their cost and get the benefit of uh, having, you know, our. I would our... love to explore that. Yeah, Mayor? and if not, there might be a way to be able to create a little local contingent with other you know, uh, mm -hmm. municipalities, not necessarily just us alone, but because everybody's going to be in that same situation. Mm -hmm. So if we can't find somebody that's already doing it, maybe we figure out if there's a way to be able to share the cost yeah. together. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Uh, you don't consider the buildings that line uh, the intercoastal as being... Oh, I absolutely do. I there didn't. just aren't that many high-rise, um, you know, buildings in Delray. Depending on what you call many, I a, a dozen? I mean, no. I mean, unless we're going to be doing all two-story and uh, to four-story, because most of our city is four and below. Well, I know? just think that there are a lot of. I I know there are these four. I don't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I wouldn't say a dozen. I don't know well, that's, how many are yeah. on the intro, on the ocean yeah. that are on the west side of A one A. They're not directly mm -hmm. on the beach, right. Right. but uh, I think there, there are, are quite a few down at the Caseria. Yeah, there are a few. Yeah. I think Anthea has an update for you on yes, what Book is doing. Well, I'm so happy. No, I'm <laughs> so not happy with this. No. Okay, so ultimately, I think the, um, you know, this has been required in some of the counties to the south of us already for a while. Um, but ultimately, most of these programs are characterized that you as the property owner has to go out to a structural right. engineer to get the report right. and to determine what you need to do. It's not the city coming in and, you know, knocking Inspecting. on the walls and, you know, and, and to be fair, we don't have a structural engineer on staff. Right. And so then it becomes the onus of the owner to maintain their property. And I think, um, you know, while you want a level of oversight, um, the design professional and the structural professionals are on the other side of the table. And mm -hmm. so outside of us requiring the filing of it, now as the attorney has said, we've inserted ourselves into that mm -hmm. process when we are not structural engineers. So I, you know, I think there's a legality that issue. We're here trying that to we make sure be. people maintain their, their buildings properly, but um, ultimately the 
I think we have to be careful that the burden of that responsibility does, doesn't, doesn't shift, shift to the city. Right. right. Um, and that is a, that is a concern for my department, for my building official. That you know they're they're not. I think it's a valid engineers. concern because truthfully, we yeah. do not want to take on this as our responsibility, and then all of a sudden something happened and it becomes a city's responsibility. So that's something that I think that you and right. you know need to share with the and find out the right, right route yeah. if there is one. I don't there know. Is one. Okay. All right. Thank Sounds you. good. Yes. Yeah. Um, lastly, as far as receiving consensus to maybe put something on a future agenda as a discussion item. I don't know if you um, noticed, but at the joint education meeting with the Palm Beach um, School District, they had a bullet point that was explore affordable housing at old Plamosa site. Mm -hmm. Now, I didn't want to jump on it because we were really there to discuss mm -hmm or a full service center in Village. But I just thought it was interesting that they even included that when, you know, that discussion kind of ended, you know, a, a year or two ago. I'm curious well, has if- it? Huh? Has it? Huh? Has it, really? Has it, right, oh, yeah. right. And so we never really discussed it as a city. We always discussed it as a CRA. I brought it up as just an outright, not a partnership, an outright purchase. Mm -hmm. What if there is an opportunity for a partnership to do affordable housing on that land? It's partnership with, it's tenant, and with, with, with the school, school district. Partners. What if there's an opportunity to do a partnership with them? Um, they don't build affordable housing. They have no interest in that. They have enough on their plate. Um, it could be it could be in combination with us. It could be there could be a P3 opportunity. Um, but I just thought it was interesting that I saw that as a bullet point. So clearly it's still <clears> in their mind, right? Um, and they don't have a plan plan for that property. In addition. Um, <laughs> Ms. Maxfield and I were at the BDB meeting, um, Business Development Board meeting, mm -hmm. and they are pri prioritizing affordable housing. Mm -hmm. They've never brought up affordable housing, been going to their meetings for years. Well, the reason they are is they're actually getting corporate companies that said, hey, we're, we're going to move, move there and bring 400 jobs. We're now only going to bring 80. Mm -hmm. Why? There are There's no place to live. live. There's literally no place for our people to live. So now BDB is getting, getting um, involved. And what they did is they hired a firm to go identify land um, across our county where that could be used for uh, affordable housing. Now they're not looking at market land because they said you can't go out and, and compete in the market right now. So what they looked at was land that was owned by government entities. Mm -hmm. And then they got rid of parks and they got rid of nature preserves and they got rid of medians, right? And then what was left? Well, in Delray Beach, there was I think six acres owned by the city, which I'm sure will we're probably digging into those six areas and they're probably not gonna be areas for affordable housing, right? They just didn't have that knowledge, right? Uh, but the other two parts, one owned by the CRA, we know it, six, seven, eight hundred block. And the second one that they identified was? Plumosa. Plumosa, mm -hmm. condemned school, um, as the two biggest properties. And I'll tell you, a lot of these cities don't, didn't have a lot of acreage, mm -hmm. um, except that when you went way out west and there was plenty of acreage. Mm -hmm. I think it's worth discussing. Uh, we need, a, we need affordable housing, and there's not a lot of land, but there's this one piece of land that another government entity owns that is also interested in housing their, their staff, their teachers, their bus drivers, their janitors. Well, listen, I mean, we've been down this path before. The, the issue has always been that they're looking at, uh, you know, market rate for their property. And I know that we went down this, this avenue before, but, I mean... The fact that they still have it and they didn't sell it and that they did have some, a little, you know, little marker on there, I saw the same thing, um, says that maybe there is some interest. I, I think it's always worthwhile exploring. I don't think it's something that, you know, uh, you know, I understand that they don't under, they don't build houses, but I mean, we've talked about that we can we can do something that would create you know, create property and, and, and houses for their, as, as a first, you know, their, their, their employees or their teachers or whomever that, that would qualify. I just, um, I was really surprised that they would still want us to buy it and then do it for them. I, I thought that that was a little bit, you yeah. know, much. And, you know, I have to tell you, I mean, the last couple of meetings I've been in, I just don't feel the love from them in our schools. And that is their, pri pri that is their, primary thing. You saw the woman down here talking about it. I cannot disagree with her. Mm -hmm. um, she doesn't, she's so frustrated. She doesn't even know where to go. She's coming to us. And, you know, we are kind of almost like the kind of second thought. Look at how much energy and time was put into Roosevelt versus our school. 
look at that they basically went out for a grant for several years for that school. We have at least as much history in our school, and they didn't bother to even do that. They own it. We can't go out for a grant. We don't own it. So it's very interesting that we don't seem to get the same love as some of the other areas, and I'm not sure the, about that. I'm not I think sure that's why. The angle you take, Mayor. Oh, I mean, I, mean, I tried. I, I went no, no, to I think them. In, in regards to this conversation, just to bring it back. Yeah. Here's a piece of property. We need affordable housing. Yeah. They didn't, they didn't start talking market rate with us. It was it was appraised appraised value. Yeah. Still very high. Yeah. Um, and and that's maybe that's the route that that we take. I, I wouldn't. I, listen, I'm I'm love. good with that. And I also, you know, on the same thing because I was going to bring this up tonight. But since you've brought this up, if you if you guys would uh, oblige me just for a second, I think that we as a city need to do a housing survey. I have to tell you, I was watching the PNZ board meeting last night, and they were talking about bringing in some. Uh, additional um, housing units um, down on the Emrock area, um, but everything that we're we're seeing now, and and everything that's in our inventory, and I don't even know how many there are, but there's got to be thousands of of apartments. They're all rentals. Mm -hmm. This is not the way that we get ahead here. And so, you know, if all we're agreeing to and approving are rentals, one bedroom, small efficiencies. If you can imagine, I don't even know how many are on there, but I just know that there's thousands of them. So they're all can come forward and we don't have anything that's coming online that's uh, affordable to buy. Ain't nobody getting ahead in this city. And it, and it, will, it will, will really catch up with who we are. So I think that we really do need to look at what we have in the, in the hopper and if, in fact, that's giving us enough of a spread in order to be able to be meeting with our comp plan, which requires that we do not just one type of housing, but all different types. And I'm, I think that we're real high, end, high heavy in one area, and we have nothing coming in on the other. And so we really have to think about that. And I, the only way that we can really do that is to know what's in the hopper and coming through. So I'm, I'm suggesting that we do a, a housing study, which would also pick up on, you know, single family homes and things like that, which would help us to be able to make a better decision, you know, with the, with the um, information and the, the data that we need to make that decision for our, for our city. Because I'm with you 100%. I mean, we got to do something and we got to... We have no land. I mean, I we agree. literally... We I, I'm in agreement with that. Okay. I think we approved something. I added it once, and it was an astronomical amount of apartments yeah. over the last couple of years. And once we see them built, it's it's changes everything. I mean, how do how do we provide homes for young people with children? How do we even you know elderly people don't always want to live in a place where they have to uh, travel a distance from their vehicle to get into their uh, door, so I'm in favor 100% of having an assessment of what we have so we know what we need and what we need to provide to our residents because we are in a situation where we need to figure out how to accommodate well, people It would be good forward. to look at it from the standpoint of a citywide and also because we are truly kind of built out. So now what's happening is, is we're getting we're getting wedge, wedges, you know, we're finding mm -hmm. places that are like in between in order to be able to like do that. So. I just think it's time for us to really evaluate and figure it out and, and then and then make a plan going forward. I don't think we can get that done by the time that we're hitting this um, goal setting meeting that's too close, but maybe a maybe a workshop afterwards that we could really kind of like dive into this and, and figure out a plan as to how we can move forward before our next uh, budget cycle is The up. Affordable Housing Committee is bringing, I think their, um, their whole strategic strategic plan, comprehensive plan is at the state I think being reviewed and then it's brought to us there's a lot of significant changes in there in, in a good way for affordable housing we're moving a lot of the barriers so it's probably best that we actually do it after that I think that's May yep sounds right? good. May, May, that comes in front of us in May um, what else you got so lastly the super seniors um, tennis championship world tennis championship kicks off Friday night um, it was they tried to put it in Delray but we're just too our, our courts are too busy, so mm -hmm. a lot of the matches will be played in Boynton and in Boca. However, out of the eight uh, hotels that are listed for all of these international, and it's thousands of people, four of the eight are Delray hotels. Good. So we actually have more hotels. There'll be more people staying. All the hotels are are are, are booked. So um, well, I think that's, that's, that's really important. The last and eating too. Down uh, here yes, too. And, and they'll be eating here too. So the last. Um, 
the last world championship was in Spain. So we're right, but you know, so it's, it's, South, it's South County. It wasn't just Delray, it's South County. So I think that's still worth celebrating. Um, thank you to Mr. Luis Baraldi. Um, I was involved in the very early conversations. He took a, a very unique approach to, to getting this championship. When they, the ITF sent a representative here, which I was asked to go, but I'm sure if Ms. Casal was on the commission at the time, he would have preferred a tennis player over a tennis fan. Um, but rather than take him out to a fancy dinner or lunch, he actually hosted him in his house. And the ITF representative said that was the first time anyone had ever done that. Hosted him at his house for breakfast, and uh, Miss Baraldi made breakfast. And if you've ever had her empanadas at the Green Market, they're mm -hmm. fantastic. Um, that's what that's what won them over about about Delray Beach, their tour of Delray, and that um, they hosted them at their home rather than just taking them out a, a night on the town like most most cities do. So I just thought that was a really nice story that kicks off on uh, on Friday night, and it's pretty fantastic. exciting. That's all I got. Good to know. Mr. Johnson. Thank you very much, Mayor. I have three items. I'll be as quick as I can. Uh, on each of your desks, hopefully you will find the yes, I did see that. Um, Regional Economic Development Summit for the Treasure Coast Region. Mm -hmm. I was uh, blessed to attend that with, um, I'm going to hopefully get her name right, Sarah Maxfield. Mm -hmm. um, very, <laughs> I wanted to say Maxwell for some reason. Sorry, Sarah. Um, I really enjoyed it. There were a lot of uh, commonalities between the attendees. Um, water was the number one issue, I believe. Um, Overdevelopment was number two. And what are we going to do with all the people that are coming that we, we don't watch out? We're just going to be one crazy place. So I just want to uh, ask that you look at it. And if you have any comments, perhaps you can mail them to wherever they said you should mail them. Uh, we are getting to the point where if you know what's happening, we are moving people away from the southern part of the region all the way up to um, St. Lucie mm -hmm. County and Fort, Fort Pierce. That's not me, I hope. Anyhow, anyhow um, it was amazing. It really was. Some very passionate public officials who don't want to see us become Miami-Dade or Broward County, and I hope they prevail because we're just overcome with uh, houses. I meant to bring a, a sheet that uh, talked about the development that some, sorry, the housing sales that are going on in the, I think she called it the, the young lady that was um, the salesperson for the flyer that I received in the mail. The Lake Ida Park, Lake Ida Park, Lake Ida something. Mm -hmm. And she really was referring to what I consider the north west section of the city on the other side of the fence okay. of Lake Ida. Mm -hmm. uh, million dollar homes. I saw one that I think sold for two million four hundred and seventy five or something like that. It's just to me astronomical <laughs> and it's just unreal the, the housing market. Don't know how long it's going to last. Uh, I'm sure the people who are selling their homes hopes it never la ends, but those who are being priced out of the market hopes that it ends very quickly. That ties in with where we're going to put the people who are affordable are not of housing that's affordable that they cannot even ever reach. We had some talk about that when a presentation was done by the Community Land Trust at the Affordable Housing Committee on uh, last Thursday night. So very interesting. So be aware of that. Mm -hmm. uh, Mayor, I read somewhere that you were advocating the city to enter into a competition to conserve water. Oh, is the that? Wyland, uh, is that the Wyland? There's a, there's a, uh, every year there's a mayor's, um, I think it's called the Wyland uh, a Challenge, and um, every year we uh, make a little quick video to help people to understand how to conserve water. So Very good. I look forward to that. Every year. Very good. First time I'd heard it. Um, well, I think that we're moving in that direction as our, you know, our, our uh, last week's uh, uh, workshop kind of alluded to in helping everybody to conserve and changing the times and um, 
you know, sprinkling systems, not right. automatically coming on at four o'clock in the morning and Absolutely. running until eight. Uh, however, I'm uh, very convinced that we won't have a buy-in for this in our city itself. Um, I hate to s tell the story, but a few months ago, one of our toilets, our ancient toilets in the down, in the first floor bathroom here, um, it was in the flush mode. mode, and there is no shut-off valve or anything. And although I reported it, it was not until the next morning that a plumber came in to repair it. So we all know that the, the building is old and ancient, and I don't know what the answer is, but I can't imagine how many gallons we had flushed down the toilet. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, so I don't know what the answer is. Maybe a, um, if something like that occurs, maybe a, an emergency plumber that we could pay whomever and not just throw up our hands and say the, pl the plumber will be here in the morning. So. Mm -hmm. I, or even if there's a shutoff valve, I, the toilets are old. It's nothing else to be said about that. Number three, I wish to thank Attorney Lynn Jellen, I think, for this beautiful uh, nonprofit annual reports. Uh, more than I probably nighttime reading. <laughs> I you shall receive. I uh, thank you. I very ask, and you shall receive. <laughs> One for here, one for there. <laughs> okay. We're going to know more about them than I ever probably wanted to. Um, it's come to my attention, however, and I'd like to bring it to yours, that we voted to have the American Academy be a part of our Neighborhood Resource Center. I went, it was one of those nonprofits, like the um, Urban League, the um, Legal Aid Society, um, Cross Ministries. Well, there's the American Academy, and I just, for some reason, that just bothered me, so I kept, kept digging and digging and scheduled a meeting and was informed that this, and did my own research, this is really a charter school that plans to tutor students out of our Neighborhood Resources Center. I don't think that was the purpose of the center. It was supposed to be you are an organization and you have a Delray Beach location where you can meet your clients. I understand that students would be there, uh, even though the excuse is they'll be there after hours so there are no adults because you know there's a requirement that if you are having children in a particular location, you can't have outside people in there. So I don't think that was the purpose of it. And I know it's not the next meeting after we voted on it, but if there's any way we can stop that kind of activity because I don't think that the center was designed for that. I don't know if our liability covers that. I'm just imagining if something happens to one of the students, um, what, would our, what would be our liability? So I'd yeah. like for have to have someone investigate as to whether or not we miscalculated. Mr. Moore, we, I had a conversation with you following, I think you brought that up during, was it the workshop? I think it was the workshop. Um, yes, ma'am, you did, what, correct. What, what came of that? I mean, Easter came and went, and I don't know what happened in between. So is there anything that you can enlighten us with? Ms. Doris, if you would, please. Yes, I know Neighborhood and Community Services went out and researched a little further on this particular uh, tenant over there, what we did find is that they are providing tutoring services. They tutor no more than two uh, students at a time uh, and are using the facility for that as, as well as uh, any other activities they may, they may be trying to do, but the tutoring activity is their main activity at this time. Well, one of the things that I think the um, uh, commissioner brought up at the workshop meeting was that this was a tutoring but with a with not not for free it was uh, you know with with profit in mind and we're now utilizing and and how in the world how did they get in versus others you know there's a lot of questions that i had because i didn't i wasn't aware of i mean i know we agreed to it it was probably on a consent agenda item but i wasn't aware of all the details of it and it's odd that we would add a line item uh nonprofit without really having discussion about you know that and so I guess my question is is that where are we with it it's it's obviously a line item now what 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 transpires it, it well it it's my understanding the way they got in was they had heard through the grapevine that we had a space available uh, 
Mm -hmm. and they requested if they could use it. It was during COVID, so there was no great demand for it. Mm -hmm. um, and we brought that item forward to the commission for approval, and you mm -hmm. did approve it on a consent agenda. Mm -hmm. um, where we can go from here it really is a matter of what the lease says, and, and it is a revocable. Uh, uh, it's a license, thank you. and it's a, it is revocable. Um, I believe there's a notice provision on there. You know, I, I think the best course of action would be to make this an agenda item mm -hmm. and allow them the opportunity to come before you. Perfect. And at that point, if you want to exercise your rights under the license, you're, you know, you have that ability. Ladies and gentlemen, direction is likewise being offered to proceed with a regular meeting agenda item to that effect within the next several weeks. Thank you. That's very interesting because I heard that there was a vacant spot. I didn't know there was a vacant spot. I don't know how they heard it. There are others in the city of Delray Beach. By the way, this organization comes from Lake Worth. I know lots of people who would love to have had that spot. And just to have, it's, it's just not what the Neighborhood Resources Center was supposed to be about. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anything else? OK, moving on. Nothing? I'll be super quick. Where is Mr. Metot? Oh, is he here? You're, to you're stealing my thunder. Did he leave? Oh, hey, I didn't see you over there. I was just wanting to, would you mind standing? <laughs> you are so bad. Tonight, you need to be, you need to be. Like, I wanted to so say somebody, somebody thank be, you so much. I ended up, guys. Deputy Mayor. No, no. Go ahead. Sam, excuse me. I'm sorry. I was just wanting to say thank you so much. I attended the Turnstiles concert. It was blew me away. I was remarkably impressed. And then Let It Be was even bigger and better. The um, flashlight Easter egg hunt was so much fun, both for the children and adults. The movie, amazing. And then obviously the Easter egg hunt the following morning. I really can't thank you and your staff enough. I, everybody is doing all this work, evenings, weekends, holidays. Thank you so much, and thank you to all your staff. And I want to piggyback on that because that's not all you did. You also, there was a sunrise um, service. There was also a service uh, with, I believe it was um, Pastor Barr uh, at Old School Square. These are all things that were approved and worked on by your staff. So not to mention, I mean, just this is in a five-day period that all of this took place. And so kudos to you. It was really amazing. You guys have gone above and beyond, and you just deserve the, you know, the, the city commission's um, uh, accommodation for everything that you guys have been doing over there. I, I, that's why I have to piggyback. Yeah, and relay that to all your staff, yes, please. Yes, absolutely. I can't thank you all for the support and, you know, I can't do it without an amazing staff of which they really, really try. You to do have one. So thank yeah. you. Very may special. I, may I just add, these are the kinds of things that should and could be in our public space that has not been before. Absolutely. I, it's wonderful. I agree. It's yeah. wonderful. And more to come. So we have more concerts on the way. We are so excited. And we saw the, the breakdown. And I thought that that was really great that you have put it out there now what we have coming and I think people are really looking forward all the way through June which is fantastic so um, great job Anything else? thank you no I'm done thank you okay and then one other thing you know there was something and Sam this this would be you too because I I said that there was something in the um, consent that I wanted to ask about I just got a call and that's the reason why I'm, I'm gonna ask about this the landscaping 6h2 and 6h3 approval for um, the award landscaping um, there was something to do with the uh, A1A, the, the promenade, and the, uh, I guess it's the maintenance of the um, uh, pavilion. Or the, the garden, I guess the garden club put all of that plantings in the front. If you need more plantings, they basically said they could go for a grant, so they wanted you to know that because that was their, you know, contribution at one point in time. They called me on this. And then the second thing is, is that a lot of it got um, trampled down because I think there's some entrance underneath. I don't know if that's happening still underneath the pavilion. You might want to check on that and just find out a way that we can secure that so that that's not being utilized after hours underneath there. So just wanted to make sure that you're aware of that. And if you need the number, I can, you know, the garden person, I can. Absolutely, I'd love the support. Right, absolutely. They, they did it before and they said that they have the ability to be able to go for a grant again. Okay, that's it. Anything else? Seeing none. Meeting adjourned.